All right, so let's just go ahead and get get started then. Well, I can still. Are, are you guys? I hear feedback where I'm sitting right here. You guys hear it? Okay. No. As long as I've got company, my misery. That's fine. So I, do, I did want to ask. So one of the things uh, in the packet um, there was the Q and A I, I mentioned a moment ago. And maybe we would go through that. Um, I hope everybody had a chance to look at it. But actually, I found that uh, section very useful. I uh, appreciate you creating that. Um, it anticipated some questions. It included questions that came from uh, members of the community, uh, some um, and, and some that came up during our own discussions. And I imagine a few that you actually just anticipated. So I think having I found that very useful. Um, and I went through that. That was actually, as it turned out, to be the first part that I went through when I did this. I did come up with a few minor questions along the way, but what we'll try to do, and if people have theirs, unless somebody has something along those lines that they're really burning for to get addressed first, um, we can, let's just go ahead and start with the policy questions because they reference these questions. And then yeah. afterwards, if we still have some outstanding questions about the Q&A, uh, we'll go back to that. <coughs> So, are you uh, can you drive that from there, uh, Dave? Okay, that, that's fine. Whatever is e easier for you. So, um, again, to kind of set this context, there's a there's a lot going. There's a lot of moving parts, and you know we have a we have a comprehensive plan, and we are planning for both certain population and job growth, and and uh, you know we need the infrastructure to go with that to plan for that growth. We also have a transportation improvement plan. Uh, that has been uh, it was a basis of some of this study, and there's quite a few projects, both for motorized and, and bike and pad as well. And so where we're at is, um, and, and we've had a lot of good presentations uh, over the last few months. And some of the uh, policy questions that we'll be addressing actually are established, done ordinance. It's codified. Uh, others have been guidance that we've gained, get, uh, given to staff, you know, throughout this process. So. But this, what they put together here in this packet is um, really a complete list, uh, and there might be a few uh, additions as, as we go through here. Um, I thought this format, before we get started, was kind of interesting to me because it's like it's kind of like budget process. Okay, everybody up or down on this policy. We're, we're not. I mean, I mean, with that checklist on there. But I think what we do want to do, as I do, uh, uh, we'll go through this once, and and, and you know, we'll, we'll certainly have quest opportunities to go back and ask questions once we get through it a little bit more. But we're not going to be voting on these uh, tonight. I mean, this is not an action move, uh, meeting anyway. But we are going to be discussing everything. This is your opportunity to get clarity and understanding on each one of these. So, Charlie, uh, are you going to facilitate the conversation? Go ahead and do that, okay. absolutely. Okay. So uh, on the first one, uh, we're really asking, uh, and actually it's just a fact in terms of the fact that we, we have existing growth targets. Um, and uh, you know, some of these are a direct result of the central uh, plan adoption. Uh, and they've been um, accomplished through the public planning process. And basically, the work that we're doing with simplified concurrency and impact and mitigation fees is just consistent with, with um, you know, what we've been doing. This is an outcome of, of our existing planning process. So any questions or concerns about that? Okay. So I'll we'll go ahead and move on to the second one. So like, question? Well, I'm, well, so I'm, can, I'm, I don't really understand what you mean by the work program is consistent with adopted city plans because if we haven't, um, <coughs> I'm just, I just don't really understand that. To be a little specific, the central plan ha had a list of implementation steps in the okay. back of each chapter and it identified updating concurrency as one implementation step and updating impact fees as another implementation step. So that's. It that's said simplified concurrency, or it said update. It just said concurrency. Okay. It didn't say the word simplified. Okay, so that's part of that. Because it almost. It might point. have said simplified, actually. I don't think it did. Because we didn't. That was one of the questions we had. When are we going to update our fees so that. Um, so I don't think it did. So I don't know that consistent is the right word. I think. Um, I think more what you said is this is the 
it's the next step or it's been identified as the next step or it's consistent with um, taking the next step or something. So that's the comment I have. Otherwise, it's, we're saying, yep, this is what we said we were going to do and it isn't exactly what we said we were going to do. Okay, good. Yeah, thanks for that clarification. I'd be surprised if staff put the word simplified to actually box yourself in so much back in 2012. Correct. Right. Yeah, we, we, we have a crystal ball. That's right. likes to say. It's not quite yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you for that. Uh, the second one is really the, the fact that we continue to monitor, monitor growth uh, and we can adjust our growth targets uh, with, and project lists in future years. So this work we're doing now is, is a snapshot in time and the way Simplify Concurrency works is every two to three years we need to update our models uh, and then make updates to projects as needed based upon real time at that time the snapshot in terms of what's happened in terms of development and the rest. So uh, that is just an, a general understanding with the council. We want to make sure you have as well. So this is every two to three year commitment. Yeah, sorry, I do have a question about that. So in this planning model, we use the horizon of 2030. So as you know, eventually we'll get there, and I'm sure our planning horizon will have pushed out since then. So, so but everything right now. So right now, 2030, it's consistent with our concurrent um, uh, comprehensive plan. This this transportation plan. Uh, and 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 all the elements of <laughs> that we're going. Through. As so so. <laughs> I don't know if that helps or not. It's feedback from where I'm sitting. Here. So j just help me with this. As, as, as we move through time, and th that, that planning horizon is, is going to go out. So, so right now, is it, is it safe to say, so for our plan horizon of 2030, 16 years out, um, you know, this is what, you know, here's the, here's the impacts of growth. Here is a transportation infrastructure that plan that adjusts that and current, some current deficiencies that we have as well. So, but things are going to change, right? We're going to get actual growth, um, and and uh, projects will get done or won't get done in the project list. So, just give me an, how does this roll forward? Could you just give us a quick, you know, give me a better image of this, how this rolls forward over time? So, the short term interval is the two to three year interval to check in and see how we're doing against reality, and and if any plans have changed or any new population forecasts have happened in that particular two or three interval year interval, we would capture that. We don't expect the long-term horizon, the 2030 horizon, to change every two or three years. It won't become 2033 and then 2036. We expect the horizon for this to continue to match the city's horizon for its overall comp planning effort, mm -hmm. which synchronizes with the regional population allocation. Mm -hmm. So the next time we do a plan and it has a 2035 horizon or 2040 horizon, mm -hmm. all these tools will be updated to match that. So our comprehensive and regional uh, um, growth plans are what are really going to drive the longer time frame. Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. If there are no further questions in that section, we'll go on to section D. And in that section, there are three, three items listed as, as facts based upon uh, prior uh, documentation related to the central plan and consistency with the central plan. Uh, the fact that cons concurrency and impact fees were contemplated as implementation strategies for the central plan. That's the first one we listed off there. Any concerns with that statement? See none. Uh, the second one is that CEPA review was completed and a determination of non-significance was issued on October 22nd, 2014. That is on the work that we're doing uh, right now. So we took a look at that to determine whether there was so, question about this. I probably should know the answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Who makes that determination? It's, that's a determination made by staff. Okay. It's, it's the, okay. The it's CEPA responsible it. official makes Yes. The there is a process that CEPA entails, though, where, it is, uh, where there's notification of other agencies that may be impacted and things like that. Could you just tell us just a little bit more about that? So the staff has an assigned staff member who is the designated official, SEPA official for the state. That's Peter, right? Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so Peter, Peter is Rosen. your staff expert, yeah. right? Peter Rosen. And so 
as any issue comes forward and the city needs to know what its responsibilities are under SEPA, Peter is tasked with determining what we have to do and then telling us you have to do a full EIS, you do a partial, you do a checklist, you do whatever. And so it's his finding as the city's official that this particular activity that we're going through here, we're not talking about the central point, we're talking about the simplified concurrency and the fees, were eligible for a determination of non-significance. So that's his professional recommendation as the senior official for the staff team on that. It doesn't mean that what we're doing isn't significant in the overall scheme of things. But what we're saying is from the SEPA law, the act of preparing impact fee costs and a trip bank for SEPA, for concurrency, are not SEPA significant events. They don't require an EIS to be done, basically. So I apologize. I'll just say again to everybody who maybe came a little bit late, we had a new audio video system installed and we're having some tech, is this the first meeting where it's being used? Okay, so we're having some technical difficulties. We're recording this audio only, we don't have video right now. So we're just going to have to put up with it. Thank you for your patience. Any further questions on the SEPA line? If not, the item number three there is the planned action ordinance assumptions and thresholds remain applicable to this proposal. So there was a planned action ordinance that the council approved with passage of the central plan and we've done a review of that and determined that the work we're doing here is consistent with the thresholds that were in the planned action ordinance. It's largely talking about trip thresholds, thousands of trips entering and exiting the central plan area. And so those same trips and same growth remains the same as the central plan remains the same. So those thresholds have not changed. Item number four. Item number four. Dave, I'm hoping you can cover item number four since you've been working on the code quite a bit. I'll scroll down. This is one small detail of the planned action ordinance. The question was raised, so when the planned action ordinance was adopted, it adopted the mitigation package outlined in the central plan EIS and all codes in effect at that time, about two years ago. So we're proposing to add a new bike pad mitigation fee. We think there's language in there that probably would authorize us to charge this fee, but just to be safe, we're proposing to put language in the planned action ordinance saying, yes, we have the authority for applicants to enter into this voluntary mitigation fee. So that's four of them. So we're comfortable that what we're doing is allowable under SEPA generally. The question is whether it has been additionally authorized in your planned action ordinance. Question? Does that stipulate that it's a mitigation fee instead of an impact fee? And this is a question I've asked before. Were there options at one time and we decided to go down one path, then another? Well, the mitigation fee is based on SEPA. SEPA requires us to state what our standards are and to give the applicant an opportunity to meet those standards in whatever fashion they propose. We're allowed to propose as a voluntary alternative a mitigation fee that's been determined in advance, but we can't require that fee. Where with impact fees, we can require it. You have a good deal of experience, the city of Issaquah does, with SEPA-based mitigation fees for law enforcement and for your general government facilities. It's been well received by the community. That doesn't mean they enjoy paying the fee all the time, but the practice of making that statement and offering those choices has led virtually every applicant to choose the voluntary payment approach. We're simply making sure that the planned action ordinance allows us to do that. We know that the law allows us to do it. So I guess my question was, though, was there ever another option besides doing mitigation fees for bike and head? Or was that always the only way to go? Well, there isn't an option to do a Growth Management Act impact fee, like our traffic impact fee or our park impact fee. We can't get there for pure bike and head facilities because the language of 8202, the state statute on impact fees, uses the word, the phrase, streets and roads. 
and the attorneys have said, well, streets and roads mean streets and roads, and if it's a complete street with a sidewalk attached, you can do that. But if you're doing just sidewalks or just bike paths, the attorneys are worried that that doesn't pass muster. Any further questions on that item? Not item E1. This gets into the discussion of mode split that we had early on in the first work session, and we felt that there was general direction from the council to look at a 10% non-motorized increase in the central Issaquah area and a 3% increase in the remainder of the city over the planning horizon. You'll recall that these are non-single occupancy vehicle trips, so these could be folks carpooling, van pools, bus trips, people on bikes, people walking, a whole variety of things, and we just wanted to confirm that, or we do want to confirm that. That's embedded in our assumptions. Any questions on that? And it's embedded in our modeling. So with Torsten on the phone, you'll probably recall that for our modeling, we assumed that those non-single occupancy vehicle trips meant that there were fewer cars on the road, which means it has an impact on congestion in the way that intersections were formed. A reminder that Torsten's work that was visible to all of us is on the chart behind Bob, the chart of many colors. So I think what Charlie's reminding us is that the right-hand version, the model with run number three, that is the basis for all of our cost estimates and therefore the basis for the fees, comes from those outcomes, and those outcomes include the statement here, that is the 10% increase, central Issaquah, 3% everywhere else, of multimodal trips, which therefore reduced the motorized trips that are behind that chart by those percentages. And that's a really good segue to the next one for the questions on load split. So hold on before you move on, Charlie. Yes. So just to be clear what we're doing in this process, in this chart, the third column, this is posed in the form of a question or a recommendation, yes, no. And so the administration is basically saying with this document that, yes, this is true, yes, we agree with this, yes, we're going forward with that. So just to be clear, and, you know, this is the ideal time if you have any argument against any of these policy statements. Obviously we'll have other opportunities as well, but this is the ideal time. By going, by continuing on right now without further discussion or objection, it's kind of an implicit accepting the administration's recommendation. But we'll have other opportunities, but I just think, just want to make sure that that's clear. So for item E2, really this is supporting the recommendation, the statement of model run number three, which is the one that Randy just mentioned up there. And it also references appendix B of the traffic rate study and the ped bike rate study as well. And the mode split assumption that's listed up above for both inside and outside of the central area. And it talks about level of service D, which is what we've talked about early on as well. That's our current level of service, maintaining that, but doing so on a weighted average basis in the future versus a straight level of service D at every intersection. Josh? So I'm afraid that things can go off in a second. I'm still not 100% on board with the whole six intersections letting them drop. We talked about this a little bit in committee, I think, last week again. And I just feel like, you know, we were not necessarily creating new problems when it comes to regional traffic that's outside our control, but we'd certainly be exacerbating the problem by allowing 8,000 trips of new development, a lot of which, granted, would be in the central area. We talked about that in committee as well. But all those folks have to go somewhere. And unless those trips are starting and ending in Issaquah, they're going to go to the quote-unquote fringes of the city. And that means we're going to be putting more regional traffic on the road. So some of it's not our fault, but under this open trip bank proposal, some of it will be our fault. And to let those intersections go to such low, lower, worse levels of service, it doesn't sit well with me. And there's some of those intersections, and we were just talking during the break about 900. I mean, it's hideous going southbound 900 at rush hour 
I can't even imagine letting that intersection at Talus Drive go to something worse than it is now. It's, it's unbelievable. And for the thousands of folks who live in that neighborhood who have to sit in that traffic, it's, it's really untenable now, so I can only imagine by 2030 by leaving that off the list, and that's just one of the six. So I'm, I'm still pretty concerned, and, and Paul said, you know, this was the time to comment on those issues, so um, I'm not saying we have to resolve that issue tonight, but I just think it bears scrutiny. Could, could I ask if we could invite Torsten to comment on that? He's really our team expert and has, um, can explain a little bit about why any intersections, why six and why these six. Torsten, are you hearing that? Are you ready to respond a little bit? I did hear the question. Um, and are you able to hear me okay? Yep. Yes. Loud and yeah. clear. Okay, great. So um, I, I hear Josh's concern, um, and it, it, it is a valid concern. Um, part, part of my response in the Q&A section uh, was that when we, when we did the central Issaquah plan, you recall that um, all the intersections that we analyzed at the time were level 30 or better. Now, unfortunately, the SR 900 Talus intersection was not one of the many that we analyzed at the time, only because it was outside the central Issaquah area. But we did, uh, at the time of the plan, Issaquah, uh, central Issaquah plan, mitigate, you know, the uh, the impact of the development within central Issaquah. Um, and so, when we did the update three years later for, for this uh, concurrency update. We expanded, obviously, citywide because that's what concurrency covers. And um, and so there were a number of intersections that floated to the top that uh, that aren't operating at level 13. But um, in our analysis, the, the, um, the, the impact of those intersections really has very little to do with the, um, the development that's associated with the Central Issaquah Plan, and a lot to do with the growth that is occurring outside the city. Now, Josh pointed out that yes, the development that we are going to allow in Issaquah will become a regional trip, and uh, at least one end of it will become or could become a regional trip. But those trips were accounted for in our mitigation package. So when I'm referring to regional trips that are impacting uh, those six intersections, uh, they are true regional trips that have nothing to do with the Issaquah plan or the central Issaquah plan. So they're, they're a trip that is heading into and out of the city without stopping. And so those are, those are the regional trips that through the update have caused many of these six intersections to, to go in excess of level service. <clears throat> and Torsten, those are not part of our 8,000 plus trips that we have available for concurrency, right? We only have the ones that we can manage. That is correct. So my recommendation to staff has been, look, I, I get that that's a problem and, you know, it's, it's certainly something that, you know, staff and, and Council should be um, thinking about and concerned about for the future, but it really shouldn't be a city of Issaquah only problem to solve. It should be a problem that the city can work with uh, some of the regional um, entities like WashDOT and others to help solve the problem together as opposed to the city taking it on as their own problem to solve. And so I think, and I hope I'm not stepping, um, you know, outside my, my bounds, but, you know, I think the plan is for staff to take on that responsibility over the coming years. But it's not necessarily part of this concurrency update to solve the regional problems. But certainly we've heard loud and clear through this concurrency update that, you know, that this is an issue and it's something that the city should should engage with you know, the other agencies that are involved in some of these regional problems to, to solve. Okay, uh, just for clarification, I think at one point you said CIP, but I think you meant citywide um, as, as, as far as all of these 
These are trips, uh, regional trips impacting those six intersections. They're in and out of the city without stopping. They're, those are throughout the entire city. I think at one point you said CIP. So, so, was, so is it accurate then to say that um, uh, what we're considering in front of us, this is, these are the portions that we own and that we are responsible for and, and we can manage. Um, but there are still um, um, two, and we have a model that says certain intersections are going to perform a certain way. And if we want to do anything about those, that's a completely separate action. That's collaborating with other jurisdictions, state, county, uh, perhaps neighboring uh, cities. And, and uh, those are other projects. And those are other funds. And those are all outside of what we're doing right here. Yes. To, 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 to say it another way, um, I think Torsten's point about those being regional in character and that we, should, we didn't understand our assignment to be to solve the regional problem. Another way to think about that is if we were to go back and change our project list and put solutions in for those intersections that are regional in character, it would lead to a massive increase in the project cost, but we wouldn't be able to pick up any more trips to pay for them. So it would, as we get later in the evening to my funding presentation, the city's funding responsibility would be for 100% of that. The taxpayers would have to pay that. There'd be no co additional contribution from growth. From growth. Okay, uh, Naya, you have a question? Yeah, well, I want to uh, support Josh bringing this up for a constructive conversation. Uh, and I think that, uh, that what, the way I've distilled it, because I've shared this concern with you, Josh, all along, and uh, learning little bits and pieces in the way it's being spoken of tonight, uh, I haven't rehearsed this, but this is kind of what I see right now, is that the policy in this, um, in the, uh, in this concurrency program doesn't say we will not fix those intersections. It just says we're not going to fix them with this tool in the toolkit. Those are still intersections of concern and interest to us, or they could be, or I mean, that's not even being decided now. But this isn't the tool for those intersections, and that they could be addressed, and we certainly, I think everybody has said that we certainly hope that they will be, uh, but not to be sending the message that the and it says no, nowhere in the policy that we won't fix them. We're just not fixing them with this one. And like uh, Paul said, this isn't the only um, transportation or traffic policy we have. We have the TIP, which is another list. And there are different places where we manage um, the performance of different projects. And this one is growth and concurrency. Yeah. Bob, did you have a comment? I'm just going to add that uh, council weighed in in the legislative agenda that uh, this is a priority to work on both uh, Isqua Hobart Road and 900, because it is a regional traffic issue to work with the state uh, of Washtenaw and with um, King County on this issue too. Okay. Right. Any further comments or questions? Clarification on that topic? Not well, Josh. Well, I I just sort of feel like. You know, I, I don't ask people when I'm sitting on 900 whether they're a regional trip or an Issaquah trip. I've probably got plenty of time. I guess I could roll down my window and do that. But, you know, I don't know where they're coming from and where they're going, but I know what it looks like. And I know what it looks like at all these intersections throughout the city. We all do. Um, you know, my point isn't that we, again, it's not that we've created the problem. I understand there's these regional traffic trips, as Torsten mentions, that are outside our control that are existing that we can't be compensated for through this funding. My concern is the exacerbation of that. It's the adding all this development, which is going to put folks out onto the roads on top of what we have today. And we can barely keep up with what we have today. In fact, I would argue that we're not even keeping up with what we have today. You look at growth exploding throughout the city on every other street corner, and we can barely do one infrastructure project a year. So I know we're going to get to that in, in the funding piece, but you know the one we did last year through the North Issaquah Railway Network that we're going to fund, that was by the grace of the development agreement. The one for Dogwood for next year, we'll be lucky to even get that done. Um, it's going to take some, some refunding. At this pace, we can barely keep up with what we have. So these regional trips, they're not going to get better and they're not even going to stay the same. They're going to get worse and worse and worse because of the growth that we're doing. So I totally get the point that's being made from Nina about we can fund it through other means or we can look at other partnerships. Um, I just don't want to send the wrong message 
through this process that we don't care or that somehow it's going to get put on a shelf because those dots are going to go red and they're going to stay red and they're going to get redder. So I want to make sure I'm clear I understand that. I, just especially to your last point, I think that's very key. It's, we don't want to send the message that we don't care about those, but when it comes to doing something about those uh, in the scope of concurrency, which is how we capture uh, infrastructure improvements due to growth, um, in our plan right now, uh, it does not include planned investments to improve the level of service over what the model has currently shown. So that doesn't mean we don't care, but as far as growth impacts, we, we decided there's nothing more that we can do, do for that. I think, that's, I think that's an important point. I'd like to echo that as well. We certainly do care. But I want to get back to kind of the, I think the core part of your message uh, in the middle of your, of your comments. I, I think I heard you say, you know, um, it, it, it's too much growth. We're planning on too much growth. Honestly, Paul, I'm, I'm starting to have a tad bit of buyer's remorse when it comes to the central area plan because I think at the time that that was adopted, we didn't really understand the funding mechanisms involved. And from what I heard in committee and, and the rest of you who are not near and I will get a taste of that tonight, um, I'm very concerned about the pass through of these costs onto the public for such increased levels of growth. And you know, again, we're, we're growing exponentially. We have been growing exponentially. And we can barely keep up with what we have. So there, and, and I'm gonna, and I may come back to this later, depending on where the presentation goes. And, and I've talked with a couple of my colleagues about this already. There's not just a capital side to this. There's a staffing side to this that we need to account for as well to get all these things done. And I'm not sure we even have the capacity to do that now, let alone in this time horizon. Yeah. So I think that's a really good point. And one of the things I've learned over those last few weeks is that until now. I've never seen any kind of, we're going to have a discussion about potential funding here tonight. I've never seen one conversation about that in the whole time I've been watching the city. I've never seen that come together before. So at least we're starting to have that conversation. I know that the city has put together transportation infrastructure plans year, every single year. And I've never seen any long range plan on how to do these before. And we're going to start talking about that option for the first time I've ever seen. So every year the council, and we've done, we've done comp plan updates, we do the TIP every year, but we've never really got down to the brass tacks on how we can do these. Um, I know, and so, I, so I, I'm really glad that we can at least start having that conversation, which we've just avoided all of these years. The other part too, I believe in this study, to your point, is that I think we did runs with no growth options or do nothing option. Uh, what, um, what are some of these columns? Does some of these columns address, I mean, because I think Josh asked, it's really down to the fundamental question. Okay, so we have, we're planning for certain population job growth. Uh, we have it in our comp plan. We have, we have it especially dense in the, in the central area, even a, an urban center designation and all of that goes with that. Uh, but the, actually the comp plan is citywide. Uh, and so we did some modeling runs that looked at some of those options of, of do, do we have any, are any of these, are any of these model runs close to uh, that where we, um, where we don't have, where we're not forecasting the growth? Okay. So the, the, there's five columns up there that have lots of green and different amounts of red and yellow. So I'm just going to refer to them as the five columns. So the one on the left is the one that is today. No growth and no new transportation improvements. It's, it's what the model sees out there in terms of traffic volumes. And there are four or five intersections that are below acceptable levels of service. Um, then the next column, the second one, is the model line in which we added all the growth and we made no transportation improvements. Okay. So if we had the, today's transportation network and all the growth, that would be kind of the worst case scenario. Okay. I believe there is something in the vicinity of 26 or 27 intersections that are below your standard. Okay. The other three scenarios are the alternatives to doing something instead of doing nothing, always with the same amount of growth, okay. Okay. and doing different versions of solutions. So the column in the middle was your existing TIP. We just took the last time you looked at this, you didn't have the advantage of all this information, you didn't have the new model, but we just plugged that in as an investment. And then the fourth column and the fifth column were variations on that. We took some TIP projects off, because we Torsten talked with you about why some of them might not be needed. And you gave him the ability to add some new projects. 
the fourth column is the try and fix everything, money is no object version. It would have led to at least a 50% increase in our estimates over the TIP version. And then the right-hand column is the one we're recommending that does have the six intersections. It's more expensive than the TIP, but it's fixing different intersections than the TIP, which is why it's doing so much better, and it's about 20, 25% more than the TIP. Okay, so you answered my question in that. None of these simulations didn't have our comp plan growth in it. They all had. They all do. They all had our comp plan growth in it. Okay. Mr. Forston may be able to speak a little bit to just the regional traffic load in our, even in our no action element. Even though it's got our plan growth, you know, if you were to take that out, you may be able to give us some indication of if we did nothing, what would still happen. Mr. Forston, did you hear that? Well, yes, I did. Certainly, you know, the regional growth is, some of it is going to use other routes if the quad traffic is using its own streets. Okay, so, you know, there's only so much blood you can get from a stone, right? So a road can only handle so much traffic, and if a vehicle has an option to go a different way, that is part of the whole modeling effort. So if there's growth in Issaquah, and that growth is using Issaquah streets, as it should be, then some regional traffic will be forced to use other roads around Issaquah to get from point A to point B. If you don't plan that growth, and it does not come to Issaquah, your streets are still going to fill up. They're just going to be trips that you can no longer collect money for, and that will become regional traffic. That you pass through traffic that has nothing to do with Issaquah at all. So, Torsten, I'll just ask this question about Talos Drive. If no growth happened, would that intersection... If we didn't plan for growth. If we didn't plan... Did you mean no growth happened, or if we don't plan for growth? I was just following up on Josh's scenario. Okay. If just no growth happens in Issaquah, and all the regional growth comes, would that intersection still turn red from regional traffic? I mean, you know, I don't have an analysis that proves that, but my gut would tell me that, yes, that intersection would still go to level service F. Sure. Okay. I don't disagree. Okay. It's a deep red. Let me just add one other thing. Yeah, a different shade of red. Yeah. Yeah, Torsten. The EIS for the Central Issaquah plan did have an alternative that is not reflected in the graphic of many colors. And that is, if you had not... If you had kept the land use that was proposed, you know, five years ago in your comp plan for Issaquah, which is significantly less growth, but it wasn't a good sort of mix of uses in the city. If you had kept that land use plan and not adopted the Central Issaquah plan, your level of service would have been much worse. And I think that the question you were originally trying to get to was, if we hadn't gone down the path of the Central Issaquah plan and just kept the land use that we were always envisioning or had planned at one point for Issaquah and still let regional traffic do what it was going to do, I can tell you, based on the EIS, you would be in a much worse situation than what we are showing right now in Model Run 3. Torsten, is that because even though there would have been less development, it would have been spread out over the whole city and so we'd have to fix every intersection? There's some of that. The other issue with the way growth was envisioned, you know, before the Central Issaquah plan was that we were not balancing the street network. So we were continuing to allow growth that would be heavy one direction in the PM and heavy in the other direction in the AM, whereas the Central Issaquah plan is a mix of uses that ends up using both sides of the street. Yes, there's more traffic, but you're using both sides of the street. And so, you know, during each peak, rather than only one side of the street being heavily used and the other side sort of being empty. So that is 
the magic of the central Issaquah plan is you, you get this mix of uses. And then on top of it, because of the mix, you're actually reducing overall traffic because now folks can live and work and play and do everything, shop, everything within a smaller area, and they don't need to get in the car and, and go do some of the things that they would normally do during a peak hour. Thanks. Okay, thank you. So, so Josh, the, the back to uh, question E2 or policy E2. So within this scope of this concurrency plan, simplified concurrency plan that we're looking at, um, uh, one of the questions we've at, we were asked, and it's reflected in the work that was done here, because like, like Randy just reminded us, the fourth column over here is, no, solve, do the best we can to solve them all. Well, we never did solve them all. Right. And it, the, the cost was stopped. Let's not even pretend we're going to go any further. So we backed off, and we and, and then there's the column five, which is which is now the one we're with the model that we're considering. So this is that's the concurrency thing, and it forecasts um, E or F at six intersections. So that policy question, without, acknowledging that we're not saying we don't care, acknowledging that you know there's regional growth issues and there are things we're going to have to do with the state and other nearby jurisdictions to address them taking those and understanding that do you st so the, but the as this policy question is formulated here does that do you do you do you agree with the do you accept the administration's recommendation or 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 not well I, I, I can accept and understand the explanation it's, it's still, in my mind, intertwined with the ultimate outcome to all this, which is how do we fund the various improvements and do all the things that allow us to maintain these levels of service? Because as has been mentioned, it's, it's going to get worse no matter what we as a city do, just anyway. But when we're allowing and adding so much more growth in such a limited period of time, and then passing on such a big share of that cost to the public and such a small cost to the people actually bringing the growth, in my mind, it's all interconnected. So in terms of an isolated policy question, I fully see why it is that we would want to have those six intersections, because otherwise you're talking about really exorbitant numbers to fix everything in the city. And that's the question I'm asking. Right. And, and I, I understand that. Okay. So, I mean, for, for purposes of this particular point, I, I really want to move on okay. to the bigger questions. All right, All right thank you. Let's let, it, let us continue. I think we're going to get those opportunities. Okay, so the next several items uh, are in, in many ways either procedural or things we've discussed this evening already. So item E3 is simply updating the TIP to reflect the table one of the traffic rate study. That's procedural. It's something we would do as a result of this work. And Yes. So does that mean that the other projects on the TIP are removed or it changes the priority of the TIP? Right. The, the, the requirement is that these projects that are part of the simplified concurrency and the impact fees must be in the TIP and the CIP of the comp plan. Okay? But that does not preclude those documents from having other projects. Does it... Uh, does it set up a, um, a, a hard and fast priority of which ones get addressed first and all that? Ask me that after we have the funding discussion. Okay, good. <laughs> I can hold that. Thank you. Because if we've got bushel baskets full of money, it doesn't matter. We can build them all. And if okay. we're really struggling to get to even the, CI, the, the concurrency list, let alone the others, then we need to have a real serious prioritization discussion. Not tonight, but we would have to schedule that. Okay, so we'll bring that back. Yep. Well, and see, that's why, I mean, that's connected, I think, with, with my question, because ultimately, if we're going to be spending our time fixing all the intersections to make green dots, we're going to be focusing on those intersections to keep them green, and not so much on the other intersections that we go, eh, that's okay, these ones can go to red. And so, in essence, there does become a prioritization depending on how much we can get in funding. So it's really interconnected in terms of what Nine is asking. Right. Uh, E4 really says that we're going to update the model every two to three years with the concept of simplified concurrency. So something we, we've talked about this evening. 
E5 is about outreach to the city of Sammamish. It's also something we've talked about in terms of outreach to, to partners that work in some of these intersections regionally. E6 is similar uh, in terms of reaching out to WashDOT regarding State Route 900, which we've talked about a little bit this evening as well. Okay, so hold on. Okay. So you just went through a couple of them. I just wanted just for rigorous purpose. Uh, does anybody have any issue with uh, accepting that recommendation? The recommendations of administration for these matters. I'm not seeing any. Okay. Okay, so let's go on to F1. So F1 is uh, very similar to uh, E3. E3, thank you. And uh, F1, basically, we're saying that not only are we going to update the TIP, but we're also going to update the capital facilities plan. Uh, so it basically is what we what we need to do in order to uh, to collect impact. And, and uh, may I add to that, you know, the last part of F1, the last sentence says, adoption of the capital facilities plan will establish a priority in which these projects are constructed in order to meet our adopted LOS standard. And, and it's, that priority is a reflection as much of what we know is feasible that we can fund. That's part of it. I mean, it's it's a capital facilities plan, right? It's 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 not just a look at we think these projects on their need merit this sequencing of priority. Correct. It's also taking into account certain realities. Well, it looks like we can. I'll give an example. This is just an example. Uh, for instance, like you know, the fifth or sixth one on the list is lined up really good to receive a certain grant and and we can see a way to funding that project. So we're going to put it in this year's CFP, for example. Yes. Another thing is, as we do the every two to three years update, projects that are scheduled to be improved sometime in the 15-year horizon, but we didn't decide a specific year, when one starts showing dangerously close to going from green to yellow to red, mm -hmm. there will be little warning signs that will be given to you saying, you might want to think about getting to that one sooner rather than later. We've only got six years to bring it back into the green or keep it from going to yellow or red. That would be another input. But I think you nailed it that, that a critical input to priority is how much money do we have. Not just the outside grant money, but at the end of tonight when we talk about the other funding, we have to solve it tonight. But if we have no commitment to any other funding, then this isn't going in place. And I said that to you a year ago. And, and back to Josh's point about only getting one project done at a time, that's another thing I said a year ago. We have to change that, and if we go forward with this package, we will be able to because we'll have a significant increase in mitigation fees and a significant increase in city commitment to the other fees. If we don't have both of those, then we're back to not being able to do enough projects, and I would step away from this simplified concurrency if that's where you wound up. Okay. All right, thank you. Nina? Yes. Thank you for uh, that, and I want to ask this in, in two ways. One is that we're changing from a, a kind of concurrency now where we're dealing on a project level basis and the project's impacts. And then there's a certain um, uh, obligation in that that is more confined. And when you have the simplified concurrence and you're looking at system-wide improvements uh, and how that relates to these lists to one another. And for instance, I have been watching Sunset, I'm going to use this a couple times tonight, uh, East Sunset sit on the uh, TIP out in where we call it purgatory. Sometime in the future we're going to do that. Well, it's not anywhere on this list, and it doesn't uh, it doesn't come up to, to play in this. You know, uh, uh, changing to a simplified concurrency is that making it even less likely to fix East Sunset, or is it uh, because of the the um, more significant or, or more urgent obligations to this uh, area-wide OS? What, am I saying that right? No, I, I, I think I follow the, the, the thread of it. I, I would, I would um, say that your concern about Sunset is very similar to Josh's concern about Talos. These are projects that are not in the list, and yet there's, for, for different reasons at different locations, concerned by one or more council members about we've got a problem here. And so I would give the same answer that, that that sunset would be outside the scope of the list we're funding here. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean we don't care and that we're not going to fund it. It means this tool won't be the one to get us there. Right. Okay. Yeah. 
And then how do we get to the Talus and 900? How do we get to Sunset? It means we have to go beyond the amount of money we need just for this and have even more. We're going to talk about that tonight. We're going to see whether or not it's even available. Thank you. Continue. Further questions? Okay, moving on. Uh, G1 is basically F1 for pedestrian and bicycle improvements. So it does the same thing. And then we're on to the parks section. So parks, uh, <coughs> I1 really uh, reaffirms your commitment to the parks level of service uh, being on a uh, per capita investment basis. Which we've been doing for 10, 12 years. So we're just we're affirming that we're not changing to some other method. The other method that's used in a few cities is the old-fashioned acres per thousand population. It doesn't work for them. It really never worked for you. So we're just we're stating we're asking for an affirmation that we continue to use that method. That's there's only two methods. There's only those two. For parks, those are really the universe. I2 uh, talks about using the per capita level of service uh, for parks and, and having some flexibility in how we add the capacity of the park system within that. Which is, frankly, it's a big sales point why most cities are increasingly going to the investment per capita approach because it, it takes you away from arbitrarily having to get a specific number of acres and it allows you to buy acres when you need acres. It doesn't prohibit it, but it doesn't require acres and it opens up the impact fees to being spent on a whole array of other improvements all the things that go on top of the dirt, the ball fields, the picnic benches, the barbecue pits, and so forth. I didn't quite understand how, it seems the park, um, the parks is calculated differently. Yes. And clearly, but, so that was an obvious thing. But I, I didn't really understand, so there's the whole, there's no deficiency. And the way I was reading this, um, figure out what your impact would be based on what your um, service level is in the past to predict what you're going to do. I, it kind of it kind of seemed like it was just a circular. If you were, you can never get any better than that. Does that does that make sense? Um, if you're basing it on what you have, how do you get any different level of service? So first of all, investment per capita does not have to be based on your current investment. It could be on a higher level of investment. But if we did that, then that would mean we were instantly deficient for all the existing population. So we'd have additional money the city would have to spend to bring ourselves up to that standard before we could charge new folks for that same standard. So what most cities have chosen is to use the investment per capita based on our current investment on the basis that it's more or less acceptable. It's, it's imperfect. There are individual parks that need additional investments and other parks that are well ahead of the game because we just made a big investment last week or last year. But taken as a whole, the amount that we have invested is good enough and we want to make sure that the next folks that come along don't use up the parks we already build, but they provide us enough money to match that same level of investment. So you're right that we've said as a matter of law that this methodology says there is no deficiency. That's not the same thing as saying there is no park that you have that isn't individually deficient and needs some investment. But making that investment come up to, to, to snuff even needs to come out of other dollars if it's truly like replacing a broken set of bleachers with a new set of bleachers. That's a replacement impact fees don't pay for. If on the other hand it's deficient because the park is underdeveloped, it's got you know a, a nice walking path. But it doesn't have the ball fields that are in everybody's plans that we need to have a more active based park system. That ball field can be funded by impact fees because it adds to the capacity of the system. And you're absolutely right that that's a totally different way of thinking about things than we do in transportation. Transportation, we have the advantage of, uh, I'm going to call it science in quotes that Torsten and his colleagues have, of the, the traffic models, the exact number of seconds of delay that constitutes A, B, C, D. We've never had, nobody has that for parks. Right. We used to try and fake it with acres per thousand, but it never bore any resemblance to real performance of the system. So the way to um, improve the level of service seems to be to add it to the capital list, not say we're deficient now, that 
because the city has to pay for its own efficiencies. So, okay, so yeah, that makes more sense. Okay. I3, uh, simply uh, really a reminder that the council um, has the ability to have a separate public process uh, that we can follow for spe identifying specific park improvements and priorities to spend impact fees that we have. If I can be specific, I want to remind, I think maybe Josh is going to go the same place. This question comes, this issue comes about because um, we have a CIP listed in the park impact fee study that is bigger than we need to spend to maintain the park impact fee level of service. And so I, I, Josh and other council members said, can, can we, do, what, do we have the right to trim that down or prioritize it or whatever? And our answer was yes, of course. And we've, we've got a commitment from Ann and the parks folks that they're going to be ready to have that conversation with you. It won't prohibit you from adopting the park impact fee sooner than you have that conversation if you're comfortable having that conversation afterwards. Or you can have that conversation beforehand and we can change the document. But that's where that came from. So yeah, the, I, w I was going to discuss that because we, we talked in committee at length about that issue. And you know, I know it's totally different than transportation methodology. But is there perhaps a parallel, at least intuitively, between this idea that we have all these parks projects that are on this list, much like we have intersections that are on our TIP, but through this process, we can only fund a portion of what's on the list, and so. It's sort of like we talked about with the intersections. We're not saying we don't care about building a new pool. We're not saying we don't care about <coughs> funding everything on the hundred million dollar list. We just can't do it through impact fees. Exactly. Similar. Yes, I agree. Analogy. Yep. Okay. So I think Randy asked an important qu a question uh, uh, that, or made a, a point that we can have a conversation about. Projects, parks, li par parks project list now before adopting new policy, or we can defer it to afterwards. And, and does anybody feel we need to have that conversation before the consideration of this proposed policy? I'm not seeing that. Okay, okay so let's continue. All right, I-4 is uh, continuing to partner with other entities such as the school district and state parks for the joint use of facilities, however, not including them in the rate study parks inventory. Any concerns or issues with that? Questions? If not, I-5 is the, the most significant question in here, which is really adopting the proposed updated parks impact fee, including the new non-residential development paying for an impact fee, in other words, a commercial related fee to mitigate the proportionate impact of non-residential development on city parks. So the administration's recommendations is an update of the existing parks impact fee that applies to residential development in addition to a non-residential fee, which we can explain in more detail. Um, you also, and I'll point out, and it's not written here, but you also have the option of simply an update of the parks residential fee, which is what we currently have. And, and we, in our November 10th presentation, showed you that we've calculated it both ways. We've calculated it residential only and there wouldn't be a commercial fee, or calculated it with the commercial fee. It's the same amount of money that we can earn. And so if we do charge businesses a couple dollars a square foot, it means that the residential fees are down a little bit. Okay? But if we don't charge businesses for anything, we stick with the old way we've been doing things, that's fine, then they would, they would continue to not pay. But we calculated for you that the residential rates would then therefore have to be up by a bit in order to make up for that lost revenue. So I have one comment, and it's a net. It's little, you know, there's so much we have to digest here. But this document brought in the, the label non-residential. I had to think about what you're talking about because all my other material, and you even just cited it, Randy, your own material back from November 10th, and it calls it business, or as you just said, commercial. So when you're saying non-residential, it took me a few clicks to go, what are, is this something new? And later on, you've done that in other places as well. All of a sudden, mixed use, we used to be talking about single family, multi-family, and now we've got something, a category called mixed use that seems to be new, but uh, we'll get to that. We'll so it's a little net. I think keep sticking with the language helps quite a bit. Thank you. Yeah, I, I take your point. Our, 
technically we've been trying to use non-residential as much as possible because the universe is either something you live in or something you don't. And when we start using words like commercial or business, there are things that you don't live in that are also not businesses. So the preferred technical term is non-residential. Um, and, and that's fine. That's absolutely but, but fine. I, but I, I confess to having been very inconsistent. I apologize for that. Any mm -hmm. difficulty you have that. So, okay, so they, so the administration had laid out two options, one that had non-residential development uh, and one that does not, which is in line with what we have here. And I, and I, and I know the numbers are in here. Yes. They're in, they're in this document. But the recommendation is uh, based upon, I mean, you don't say it here, probably in the discussion, is that, you know, non-residential development, we're talking about jobs that whether that the, the, those – People filling those jobs, whether they live here or not, are getting a benefit from the parks. And so this is a this would be a policy to say that to that for jobs due to growth, we're ask we're, we would be requiring them to pay an impact fee for parks. You would not be pioneers in this. You would not be the first city in the state. Um, this is uh, still not the most common practice, but out of the seventy. Seven or 78 cities that have park impact fees, uh, about 15 or 20 of them have uh, park impact fees that are charged to businesses. Okay. I'm seeing nods or no response at all. Okay, continue. All right. Dave's going to take us through Section J, so I'm going to send okay. it over his way. Thank you very much. J1. So this is the administration of it in this little nuts and bolts. So the first one is to use a simple trip bank withdrawal method which is Randy's uh, spreadsheet that we saw at the open house. It's a spreadsheet posted online. You can plug in your number of units, your square feet, and poof, you'll instantly know what the impact fee amount is. Go ahead, Nina. I have a question about the calculation of the trip bank that mm -hmm. came up recently. I've been following you the whole time, but there's a uh, we've been talking about whether the external trips are included in the trip bank. Mm -hmm. And then when we get to the dollars uh, discussion, which we are going to have later, there's uh, the external trips that we can't charge impact fees for. Mm -hmm. that are and so it seems like we're not counting them and then we are counting them. Right. And we are doing this differently. Um, I'll remind you of the um, portion of the PowerPoint that we did uh, on November 10th, where we had the slides that Torsten did with the, 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 the um, map of the trips from existing development to new and to vested and unvested and then we talked about internal and external and what we said and I want to say it again as clearly as I know how is that the universe of all those trips is the same. There are internal trips, there are external trips, there are internal to internal, external to external, there are vested, there are unvested, all that, that's all the same. But there are different rules about which ones we can count for concurrency than the rules of which ones we have to count for the impact fees. <coughs> the, the, short, the short version of why is that for concurrency, we are uh, we're telling people that they can develop because we have enough trips that serves their development inside the city limits. So external trips are just completely off the table for concurrency. You have to start or end or both in Issaquah in order to be a trip that we count for concurrency. That's our 8,400 trips in the trip bank. Okay? We take those trips and some more trips for the impact fee calculation because the statutory requirement that we charge impact fees on a proportionate share basis, that is every trip is treated alike, okay, we have to count trips that use our roads even though we don't have a cash register where we can collect that from them. So that's the external trips that we divide our total millions of dollars of costs by our internal trips and some of our external trips. The external trips that we're allowed to exclude from the impact fee calculation are basically the I-90 kind of trips. They never stop for anything. They don't wave as they go by. They don't use our city streets. But they're counted as going through the city limits of Issaquah and the traffic model. So we were allowed to not charge those. But if people get off, the, if they come to town on an external trip, but they, their external trip started with a new development out in the county or in some Amish or in Renton or something, we don't have a cash register there. But the law says to me, I have to calculate their trip as though it was somebody was paying for it. What happens is, and this is going to come out of our funding discussion, one reason the city share is so big is because we have to pay for those external trips. 
So you're right on different for different rules for different laws. No wonder I was confused. <laughs> Yeah, but this trip bank is for trips that do grow. Either a, a, a resident trip starts within the city, this is a resident growth trip, or a non residential development job yes. um, lands here. Yeah. So it travels here for that trip. trip. Yeah. Or they or they both start and end either type in here. But this is the bank, this is the this is the eighty four forty one yeah. that's in the bank. So this is so this is this is dramatic this is the big part about talk, the word simplified. Is, is probably greatly uh, illustrated this, with this concept of a bank. And it's those 8441 that are going to be the only people who are going to pay us. But the amount for they're growth. paying for, for growth, but, but the amount that they're paying us for growth was reduced because we had to divide our total, total cost by their trips plus the external trips that use our roads, even though we don't have a crash register for them. Josh? So under the old system, you know, when you came in, you had to mitigate your impacts. Mm -hmm. And now what we're saying is we're going to change to a system that allows the city by way of policy to decide what traffic projects we want to do to fix those impacts, maybe get the biggest bang for our buck. The, the concern I have about the trip bank model, and again it comes back, it's going to be tied to the funding, is the idea of saying the bank is open, come write your check, come add your trips. And whether we can keep up with the pace of the check writers because the money that we get from them writing that check is a fraction of the total cost necessary to construct one of these projects on the list. Yes. And so as opposed to before where there was actually a nexus between the development and its impacts, now those impacts can occur in the city. The development can occur and we may be a unable to balance off those impacts of that development because we just can't keep up with the pace of infrastructure compared to the pace of check writing and buying trips out of the bank. If we don't come up with the city's share after our conversation tonight and for future council discussions, then you would be exactly right and you shouldn't do any of this. Okay? If on the other hand the council makes a commitment to the funding of the rest of the share, then we not only have developers' money coming in at, a, at an accelerated rate, we have new money from the city, and the problem won't occur as it would have in the past because we will have cash flow to keep up. And the, the timing of that remind us the, the impact fees have to be spent, was it six years or ten years? Ten. It was ten years yes. to actually spend them. Right. And this had come up, I think, in committee, but what was the percentage, and this will probably get into the funding, so I don't want to touch on it too much, but the impact fees pay for about, what, 20% of the total? The impact fees for the traffic portion, for the roads and streets, pay about 20%. The uh, mitigation fees for the bike ped will pay about 45%. And if you add all the dollars together and smoosh them together, you don't average those two percentages because the street piece is much bigger. The average is about a third, about 30% of the total of all uh, cost of all the improvements for growth will be paid by growth. I, I, I want to add too is um, um, when I was introduced to concurrency, at least the current state, and we did this in 2012. Uh, one of the one of the things that just jumped out to me was that we had a concurrency model that was completely not aligned with the vision uh, for this city, not aligned at all. Right. So we were collecting money for the impact of growth, but it was not being applied toward what we were planning uh, for when it, you know when we were planning citywide for both population and job growth. And I thought that that was problem number one we needed to address. And it's clear to me through this process that 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 this approach allows us. There may be other approaches, but this approach uh, does with this idea of the trip bank does. And I think, Dave, you said something earlier. One of the questions I had is about how, how, does, how, how are the number of trips calculated? So a uh, project, I think you just spit out a couple of factors just like this. How is that done? You want to do the trip bank? Yeah. Trip calculator? Yeah. So while well, Dave's getting us uh, something to look at on the screen, we use the national data set for if you build this kind of development, you're going to generate a certain number of trips. And you use them right now in your current impact fee system. You use them in traffic modeling. And we are, not that one. 
We don't need uh, to yeah. look at numbers. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. I, I was just going to. I don't need to see a calculator. calculator. Okay. Um, so without this, without the screen, what what happens is we have a spreadsheet, and you tell me how many square feet of office space you're going to build, Factor and it knows feet. how many trips per square foot of office space, and it spits out a number that says that must be the number of trips you're doing. Okay. So when you did the Costco development agreement, and you were approving a million and a half square feet. We're basing the number of trips coming out of there on those standards. Okay? And so what we're going to allow is everybody else to use the same kind of a spreadsheet. They'll put in the, <coughs> the, the column on the left that highlighted in light blue how many apartments, how many square feet of office, how many square feet of retail. And if you plug those in, it will tell us the number of trips in the kind of whatever that is, golden, green color, and then the other three columns will tell you what the fees are. Okay, so the factor changes based upon land use category, and it's a function of the number of square feet. Correct. And you can see that in the third col the first column of data, the 1.42 and 0 0.088. Yeah, different land uses have different trip generation. Okay. Okay. So we're still on um, J1. 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 Just one quick question about that for you. Sure. Um, who ultimately decides if something fits in a certain category. In other words, there, you know, a developer comes in and argues, oh, I've got a you know, sit-down restaurant. It's not really a fast food restaurant. Or, you know, who makes that call of whether you're an A or B? So this list is actually an excerpt from a list with about 50 or 60 right. categories. Right. And even that will anticipate every possibility. And so if someone comes to us with something that's not in here, the, the code basically provides that the city's expert can propose and, and, the, the, and say, we believe you are most like this one, but it also allows the applicant to go, okay, I'll go your way, or no, I disagree, I'll get my own expert in here, and they'll have to produce a study signed by a licensed engineer providing the data, which we can accept or not accept. It, it depends on whether it's good enough. Okay. Ready to move on? Or yeah, let me just say we're in J1. We have uh, J2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. Uh, and at that point, uh, we're going to take a, a, a short little uh, break and we'll come back and do audience comments. And we have a funding conversation? We're going to have a funding conversation. That will be way shorter than this. Mm -hmm. well, at the end of J6, two things I think are not on the screen. Okay, we'll, we'll have general discussion. Fine. Thank you. Right, number, right, number, J2. Two. number two is the change of use for existing buildings. The proposal is to not subject them to concurrency review or any of the impact fees, mitigation fees we're talking about. So that's that is a change from what we do today. Well, that's good news for the business community. Say if you're moving a business across town, there is no fee for these businesses moving across town or moving into existing space. In, into an exist moving across town into an existing building. Existing buildings. Right. And not changing the size. Correct. Just being clear, because if you move across town into an existing building and add 500 square feet, you're going to pay for the 500 square feet. Well, it's it's based upon the building. Right. <laughs> you, it, whatever. You don't change. You, uh, the use of a building changes. We're not going to capture any impact. Correct. Fee for that. Nina. I'm not um, stating this because I object to that, but we just talked about that list, which is four pages long and wide-ranging um, ratios for different uses. And, and as Josh just pointed out on that little summary, the difference between a sit-down restaurant and a fast food restaurant sure. is a huge difference in what we perceive to be the impact. Agreed. Uh, however, here we're not going to do it. For two just, reasons. Yeah. Okay. The first is, you as a city have been charging this every time there's an increase in the use. Mm -hmm. But when there's been a decrease, you haven't been fair and equitable and said, oh, you're entitled to a refund, or we need to record that down zoning so there's a free re-up zoning later. That's why, it's the main reason why most cities don't do changes of use, because you really ought to be doing that math and you're not. Um, the other reason we're not doing it is because change in use trips don't exist in the traffic modeling that we did for this. Okay? All of the trips that are coming from growth are coming from growth in new buildings. Mm -hmm. okay. So we aren't saying, Torsten isn't saying that there is no activity going on and change of activity going on as a result of the change in use. But they're not showing up. They have zero effect on our, on our modeling effort and therefore zero effect on the which intersections are working and which ones are not. So, yep, they could make it worse than that. 
But when they down, when they change the, the use to a lower zone, they would make it better, and we don't give them the credit for it. So we're just suggesting because they don't exist, it's not an exemption. We're just not counting. Well, they exist. We chose not to account for them in the models that Correct. Forrest and ran, right. and and it's kind of in line with the, that label uh, simplified. Yes. Uh, so so this simplifies it. So any questions? Did you have a question about that, John? Did you see we, we've talked about it, and, and I totally understand the, the methodology. It still doesn't sit 100% well with me because I think we use the, the analogy I brought up of, say, the Staples building on Front Street. And you know, you could turn that existing building, which is a fairly large facility, into a much higher use and spit a lot of cars out onto Front Street and create a lot more traffic problems than already exists. And that's not being considered. So I totally understand the idea of. We don't credit them if it's a downgrade. We don't fight them if it's an upgrade. But it seems like with our development potential and what we're planning for, there's a lot more potentials for upgrades than downgrades over the next 30 years. So it just it, it troubles me, but I also understand the methodology. So that's the best I can say at this point. Yeah, I'll, I'll respond to just the truth is we don't know. And, uh, yeah. and you know, I am kind of depending upon the uh, opinion of the experts here that net, it's a push. Yeah. Yeah. Torsten, I've done my best to uh, repeat what you've taught me on this issue. Do you have anything else you can uh, add in a short answer on why we left the, why we treated the change in use the way we did? Well, uh, all I would have to add, Randy, is um, just to remind again that we are doing the updates every two to three years, and staff and, and, and Randy and I had the conversation that, hey, look, um, in, in two or three years, if we find that the change uh, in use of the existing buildings has been sort of mostly an up, um, an up change, so we we're generating more trips based on you know, new, new uses in existing buildings, then that's something we can revisit again in two to three years. Um, so. I guess the point is, we're never getting so far into the future um, that we haven't monitored it and, and haven't sort of thought about it as something that we can always revisit, um, you know, if we're finding we're getting way out of balance. Thank you. All right, thank you. Let's go on to J3. Number three, uh, this, this talks about, so today we have a concurrency fee, application fee, and that methodology is going away, so we need to find a new fee that fits the new methodology. <coughs> so an equitable way we thought of was to look at a, a per trip fee. So a small project pays a small fee, and a project generating a larger fee pays a larger fee. And we estimate to have a commitment to help fund this traffic model update every two to three years. If it costs approximately $100,000 or so, this would generate about 75000 to cover that cost. My question would be is how would we, uh, so we're collecting an application fee now, right? And that's just what, is it just going to re into general fund or are those restricted funds we have to use them for? Fund, I think. You know? You're asking where, to, where the application fee for, for the permit counter goes? Which fund goes into the currency application fee? I guess the general fund. Just for like a building permit? No, it's, it's a, if, if they have to run the concurrency model and take oh, the law. Oh, that goes into the job. Oh, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Those are offset costs. Okay, we lose sight of it. So, any comments or questions about that? Okay. Okay, so the administration has recommended that we add $50 per trip. Another to the, and it's in the um, traffic, the traffic impacts, credits. Okay. So next page, J4, number four. This is in response to some comments we received. The fees should not, should the fees be phased or not phased in over a period of time? Um, and, and so, or should they be delayed by three to four months? Sometimes some of these new fee schedules are given a kind of notice date, three or four months. 
Um, and then number five below, which also ties into this, but uh, for number four, the administration is recommending an effective date of January 1st. Um, and then number five, we'll talk about some other projects that may all projects in the pipeline and pay a smaller fee. So while you're thinking about that, I'll go up that page. Yeah, I'm not sure I quite understand that. Four says fees should not be phased. The fees should not be phased in over a period of years. However, the effective date of the new fee can be delayed three to four months to provide for <coughs> advanced public notice. We recommend effective date be January 1, 2015. That's a new way of measuring three or four months to me. I think the <coughs> goal here was that uh, we've given a lot of public notice. There's been a lot of public input. Uh, council's been looking at this for a long period of time. Um, although the final numbers may not be officially out. So if council wanted to delay uh, to provide some additional notice to potential projects, but a lot of the projects, either they're in development and they're going to pay what they're going to pay what they were before, or they're going to pay what it is come January 1st. So our recommendation was to have it become effective January 2015 unless there's some additional well, desire for public input. Well, I would agree that we worded this one really badly. I mean, it, it should have been two options. We could or could not phase it, and we could or could not do a three to four month delay. And instead, we're making an affirmative statement. We should not do this. And then you have the choice on this other one, and we didn't mean it that way, so bad grammar. We'll try it that way next time. Yeah. Dave. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, so the whole idea of delaying or phasing it in is, so Randy, you can't see this, but I have your November 10th presentation. and Well, actually, the trip bank. You know, so everything that we delay, um, or, or the any delay uh, means that we start, though it would be the, would be a new concurrency. It would be the new concurrency model. Yes. Or so actually. So my guess, my question is, what do you mean? What do we mean by delay? Are we adopting the new concurrency, but we're just <coughs> delaying the fee part of it? We're going to retain the old trip fee. Yeah. But it's the new model. So someone's going to come in, and you're going to you're going to look up your chart there, and your land use is this, and it's square foot this. Therefore, you you are 75 trips, uh, and and somehow we're going to calculate yeah, three, something off that. Th three to four months delay means exactly that. Let's let's say it was four months. But it it's the old rate. It's the, still the same calculation of the number of trips. Number of trips is the same, but the rate would be at the old fifteen hundred dollars a trip instead of the new five thousand dollars. a trip. Right. So the trip bank would be debited. We take right. we take we take trips out mm -hmm. of that. Yes. And so and so the um, that we so what we. So the numbers you gave earlier of, of at the current trip bank of 84.41, with you know traffic growth paying for about 20% of the needs, bike and ped for about I think you said 45%. Right. Those numbers start to change the more trips that go out of the bank at the old rate. Correct. So those percentages start going down. And the same thing is true if you phase. Right. Because if you phase, you'd have some increase, but not the whole increase. And so the difference between what you could have charged and what you choose to charge in an earlier time horizon is also lost revenue. So I think you know part of this, as I'm just listening, is I don't even know if you can do that. If it's uh, gifting of public funds, or um, if you choose to, you know, have the new program start January one, and it starts on the fee starts April first, would the general fund really be responsible? Because I don't know if you can start the fee later without necessarily having, with the new system, um, it seems like the system is tied in directly with whatever the fee is. So well, I suppose you could delay everything, including simplified concurrency trip bank. Right. Seems like everything. the program should be, yeah. exactly, should be connected with what the fee is. That's right. what I'm saying. Yeah. So if you're going to start it, I'd suggest starting at January 1st with the fee starting January. Okay. 9 so uh, it's hard for me to talk about this one without talking about five. I don't know what letter we're in here. But, you know, five. Yeah. So um, to better understand uh, who the candidates are and are not 
when the new fee goes in, let's say it goes in January 1st. And by the way, when I'm looking on 5, is that correct under the discussion Q&A, December 31st, 2013? No. Is it supposed to be no. 2014? No, I don't know. 14? It is correct, actually. Okay. okay. No. 20. No. I think it was 2013. Yeah, that's, that's correct. Yeah, that's correct. 2013. So, help, yeah, help me explain this, and, and so who, so what, what is the trigger, what's going to happen when the clock, okay, I'll make sure I'm in it. So, the idea number five, yeah, I'm using, that there are projects, this, this generated from a comment, uh, there are several projects in the pipeline, especially those that came right before the recession hit, in 2008, in fact, and then there's another wave that came, uh, like 2011 and 2013, that are in the pipeline. They've made their investments, um, and many of them are subdivisions. So they've, they've what do you mean by made their investment? I'm sorry. They've, they've committed to a project. They may have exchanged hands. With bought, us? bought the prop. No, oh. quite private transactions. So okay. I, yeah. Okay. Um, but they've committed to the project. They have received a permit approval from the city, say to subdivide the property. That's step one. But then step two, to build the roads, and then to build the houses, that hasn't happened yet. And so they're kind of halfway through the process. It's when the, the house, when the single family house permit fee is, uh, it, when the permit's issued, that's when the fee's paid. But, but the developer has committed to a project several years ago. So halfway through the project, the, the fee goes up. It isn't just a moral commitment, I promise to build it. We're talking about people who have actually had to go out and, and undertake Response. funding, they've done their financing, and to, to not allow them this recommended uh, treatment would mean basically they'd have to start over on the funding, which could well put the project at risk. How many trips are we talking about? How many trips? We've done some analysis of units, and we haven't converted the trips yet. But is it figured in your? Is it right. assumed in your? In your? Is it assumed in your fees that you're recommending? Is that already assumed? No, it doesn't change the fees. These are simply developments that would, um, by grandfather, they would pay the old rates because that was what was in their pro forma. <coughs> but is that assumed in your? Trip model? I think it is. Is it all assumed? They're part of the 8400 though because they are not. They haven't been built yet. And, and they're not vested development in the sense that we mean development agreement vested. It, it, it invested in the sense that they haven't paid their impact fee. Correct. I, yeah, I'm okay. still not sure that I'm clear. Is, is this, they is it an assumption already in the, what you're asked, what would be asking us to adopt or not? I think the way I understand your question, I would say not. In other words, we have, we've not made any adjustments to the trip bank or to the, to the impact fee amounts or to the funding by the city for the city share to account for what would be, we don't have the number tonight apparently, but a relatively small number of trips <coughs> associated with development that started basically a year ago or more and who were tied into their funding and their other commitments and we feel like they've made enough progress and are locked into small commitments that sure, it seems unfair. But I think we have not accounted for so if we don't get the full money from them, where does it come from? And I think it will come out of the city share. We think it's small, but it will come out of our share. So are these projects that would be considered vested anyway? Not in a legal sense. The lawyers would say, no, vesting only means a completed application for a building permit, and they're not here with a building permit. That's the whole point. But they have, they have made previous uh, applications to the city and have been given official approvals by the city for prior permits. Mm -hmm. They might have gotten a subdivision or a preliminary plat. So what you're, you're really saying that they've sort of they've sort of relied on what, what what the figures have been to get as far as they have in the process, and um, yes, and right. they would have no other no other um, they couldn't really have done anything but to rely on that, and so Correct. okay, Josh. So let me just follow up on that. I mean, typically laws are presumed to operate prospectively. And so if this system gets implemented, those who came in under the old system and who relied on the lower impact fees, would we be able to take that money and use it towards the 20% and 45% by PED, which is the new law, or by grandfathering them in, 
do they have to then mitigate to their own impacts as opposed to the, do you see the, what I'm saying? In other words, you, you, I'm not sure you can have it both ways and say, well, you get to pay the old fees, but we get to take your money and put it into the pot to use anywhere in the city that we'd like, because that's the new law. Um, I think we're talking about a pretty small amount, and if, and if the, and if the um, best approach is to keep the old money in the old account and spent on the old projects, I, I wouldn't have a problem doing that. Um, the whole question is whether or not we're agreeable to the underlying policy statement here that we would create that situation. If we don't grandfather these folks, then they're paying the new fees and the question doesn't even arise. Right. I think maybe it becomes a legal question that we don't have to resolve tonight, but I just yeah. commend that to you for sure. Your does, it, does it really? I mean, it seems to me we have, if we have a new concurrency system, and, 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 and I think it gets back to this word invested. invested. To me, vested is they've paid their impact. They've calculated the trips, they've paid their impact. Vested is Well, I mean, the way we're context, we're using it here. He's talking about saying they, they've invested. No. So the only, people, the only people who have a legal right to say to us, you can't charge me your new fees, are people who are vested as that law, as that word is used in Washington law, okay. which means a completed application for a building permit has been accepted by you as complete. Okay. These folks wouldn't qualify for that rule because right. they haven't okay. pulled a building okay. permit. So my definition was wrong. I get it. So, but, 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 you, but your definition was the kind of generalized plain English version that we all use of, well, they have rights. But for this one, the rights for impact fees occur only with a completed building permit application. And what we're proposing here the diff is, is, is a, an exception to that. Right. Yeah. So there's that. There's the policy question, and then there is there is the legal question that Josh raised, and that is, um, what do you do with fees that were collected based on sort of an old system? There, um, we I don't know that it's a big deal, and I don't know that it's a lot of money, but it is. It is. You have to figure out how you're going to comply. Well, it seems to me what we're trying to do is 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 be fair to those that have, they, 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 they've done a development based upon a performer. They made, they made a decision, they've, they've taken some risk, they, they put some skin in the game based sure. upon a performer with an estimate based of impact these would be. So what we're, what we're what the discussion we're having, the policy discussion, is if, if we don't change things underneath them. Now, in terms of their costs. Right. Now the actual, the yeah. concurrency plan can be completely different. It's just the rate per trip that we charge for those grandfathers one will result in a fee similar to what's in their pro forma as opposed to a new rate that that new projects would get. Yep. Right, but there's a, there's a separate question and that is how do you, um, what do you do with the fees that you collect, whatever you based it on? I, I, mean, my, my, I was trying to answer that and saying they're, but they're part can. of this new post, they're part I don't of the new project. I think because I think Josh hit it on the head. You have to, what do you do with those fees? We have an old program and a new program, and not, I don't know what the answer is, but it's a, it is a separate question. It's a policy right. question, then there's sort of an implementation. So, so, the, so we question. have a fund balance right now. Diane has money in the bank account in the current impact fee account that hasn't been spent yet, but has been collected. And you will continue to spend and continue to collect until this new law takes effect if you, if you adopt this. Okay. And so she has to see to it that public works folks spend the money only on the things, the project list that that was earned for. Okay, which means not bike pet facilities for starters. So if we have this group of people who also are paying under the old rules, that money will have to go into the old project. Okay, so my, my general sense is that, that we grandfather them. Uh, I'd, I'd like to clarify it further, and, and I, I wonder if any of you agree with me when we're talking about there are different steps along the way of um, going from thinking about developing in a place and then actually doing it. And one of the steps was um, running a pro forma, maybe getting funding, funding for a purchase and sale and buying a piece of property. Well, that's an that's a investment risk that many people take on many levels, and there was no um, handshake about the relationship with the city. It was, it was an uh, opportunity to buy a piece of land with certain assumptions. However, if there was a handshake with the city and a permit approved that has a certain capacity in it, I could see that drawing the line somewhere around there and saying, you know, we have agreed to allow you to develop this property to a certain capacity. And that would have ease at that particular time. 
But I'd like to be very clear about where that line is drawn and not just a speculative real estate, hey, I've invested in your city by buying 10 acres in here, but rather to say that it's when, and a particular permit, because I don't know all of them, Dave, which is the one that says that that property would be developed to a certain capacity. Which permit is it that? So does that, is this sufficient? I mean, this says land use applications deemed complete prior to December 31st, 2004. Well, how many different kind of land use applications do we have and how many say when they go through the progress as they get more refined towards actually building? So the examples would be site development permit, administrative site development permits that are reviewed by staff or go to the development commission or UBDC or subdivisions heard by them, your example. Those are land use applications. Those are under that? Yeah, it's those things. Okay, okay. Pretty much just those. Okay, I can go with that. Okay, so J4 still is, I don't think we have really got resolution on that. That's the one that basically, I think the administration recommendation is start the plan January 1, 2015. That's what J4 says. And J5 says there are some development activities whose land use application was deemed complete prior to December 31st, 2013 that would be grandfathered and not subject to the new policy. In terms of starting this entire plan January 1st, I have to withhold determination on that until we've explored the funding piece. But, I mean, we looked at code a little bit, but I think the prevailing sense I got, at least from Nina and Mary Lou, was that we weren't going to delve too much into the actual code language until we got through the policy issues. And so there was a comment, I think Mary Lou had said it, and she unfortunately couldn't be here tonight, but that we may need to revisit this at a committee level to look at some of these further details and the actual code language and some of those things after we get past tonight's policy level discussion. So when you say January 1st, I understand the need for a uniform start date, but I don't know if 1-1 is necessarily that sort of thing. Well, understood. Yeah. And so maybe, yeah, so it could be, you know, it could be, it could be, you know, at the beginning of the next month after which it is adopted. Okay. So that, I mean, that's a good point. I mean, you know, there's, it's not clear to me that we're going to do anything in the weekend. But I don't think we're months away. We may only be two, another two weeks or two or four weeks at most. And so having it say January 1st would be really is, yeah, it would have to slide. Okay. Any other comment about J-4? J-5? That's the grandfather concept. Okay, good. And then J-6, which I believe is the last one on the list. Before committing to payment from the proceeds of the sale, the city needs to better understand the risks and rewards of this proposal. Let's clarify that. That's not written correctly. Thank you. The idea is today the bill of the code says, in fact, these are paid at building permit issuance. And this is in response to the meeting with the Master Builders Association requesting delay of payment of the impact fee to the time of closing of the house sale. That's what proceeds of the sale means in their language. In plain language, it's just postpone it to the closing, let the escrow company figure out, you know, where the money comes from. It's still going to, you would still get the money before the closing. And the Master Builders feel that that extra amount of time allows a particular smaller member who are operating on a mortgage interest rate to not have to draw that money out when they're drawing the money out for the cost of the building. A few cities do it. A few cities don't. Total policy call. So our policy on this consistently has been not this. We collect it at the time of permit. And this issue has come up to council a few times on the legislative agenda because it was before the legislature a few times. So the only reason this is on the list for now is that they have a certain request of the Master Builders. Right. And the administration's recommendation is yes and no. Yes and no. It's a definite maybe. Yes. So, yeah. Yes, we're open to learning more. Yes. 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 Y
No, not at this time. But our current policy is at the time of the app application. Is that right? At the time of the issuance of the issue permit. permit. Thank you. Thank you. Nina? I agree with the administration. The, the yes or the no? Uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, to uh, to um, require the fees at the building permit, and it, it's concurrency, it's called concurrency, and we've all watched how a uh, market can build things and then not sell them, but we still have to build the roads and, and build the infrastructure that is for that, and the timing, um, I definitely think it has to be during yeah, we'd be shifting more risk to the public right. at the time of the close mm -hmm. yeah. at the proceeds from the sale. Any other comments about J6? Okay, so are we really waiting for more information on that one? It's the SES. Yes, the city is open to learning more. No, the city does not have enough information at this time to adopt. It sounds like you feel that you have enough information. I mean, that's what I'm hearing. That's what I heard from you. That's 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 Do you have a comment you want to add, Diane? I'm sorry? That's some research. Regarding? Six, five, or four? Six. 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 Okay. Six. Six. So in preparation for tonight's meeting, the finance department was asked to do some analysis on what's happening in other cities, and um, there's a wide variety. There are some cities that um, allow it to be done when they're putting up um, drywall, sheetrock. Sheetrock is when they have to pay. Others at the time of certificate of occupancy, which is prior to sale, and then other times it's at the sale. It is a lien against the property. Um, many, many, most, the majority of the cities charge a fee up to, on average, $250. For the city of Issaquah, we, will ha we have a couple of interesting challenges because we're so decentralized and we're not all in the same building. And, we, and um, the building permit system and the financial system don't talk to one another. Um, making sure that we would always capture those fees would be of a concern. Um, right now, on average, we do what we call closing, opening and closing our um, information to escrow companies. In the winter months, we run 20 to 40. In the summertime, we, in the finance department, we would run maybe up to 80 to 100 a month. Each one of those would have to be verified if it was a new home and whether or not they had paid or whether it was simply an existing home that had turned over. The one piece I have not researched is if we miss one and we don't collect the fees, what happens then? Um, and part of the challenge is under state law, when you go through escrow, you have three days to complete the form. So it's not as, and so in the finance department, we're very accustomed to the fact that when a closing bill comes in or when the information comes in from escrow, we know we have three days to respond to that. So we would have a lot of operational inefficiencies and the potential, probably an increased risk, particularly at time of closing of a house. So um, we look at about eight or ten cities. Um, Bellevue doesn't have, uh, allow for deferral. Um, Sammamish does. Kirkland does. Um, two or three of them are sunsetting their program either in 2015 or 2016 because many of them did it based upon the economy and when the recession was in place, what they were attempting to do was to continue to encourage development and growth. So they were willing to accept um, the deferral of that. So um, have a lot of information if you want to go into more. Um, so we have, we've done the yes and the, the research part. And so the answer is still probably no. Any questions? Okay. So the
administration's recommendation is no. <laughs> so, council, questions about that? Concerns? So, this is basically saying at the time of that the uh, the uh, permit, permit is issued. Okay, Josh. Before we, uh, so thank you. I think of the what's on the paper. Josh indicated that you had a couple policy questions you wanted to bring up. Yes, there were two I had in mind, and then there was a third one that came to mind. I'll start with that one first because it may be easier, easily resolved. I recall somewhere in the discussions we were getting rid of the 30 trip uh, exemption, 30 trips and less, but there was still something about safety and access determination that had to be done. Yeah. Could you just explain what's being kept or lost in that? The 30 trip threshold would be kept for that. And the safety and access um, uh, impact analysis would be limited to um, essentially the, the portion that they're already doing now under your current analysis, but it's just the portion that looks at what is their access point, where's the driveway located, when they come out of the driveway to create safety problems, or when they come out of the driveway to create operational problems that isn't unsafe, but it causes a backup because they're too close to the intersection. That's the limits of what that would be required to include. And anyone's exempted from that or not exempted? Well, nobody's exempted. It's just that it doesn't apply to small-scale development because those kinds of impacts from anything under 30 p.m. peak hour trips are considered not typically to have safety and operations problems. And that's the way we do things now? It is. Yes. Okay. So that, I guess, unless we want to change that policy, that would be one issue. It doesn't sound like we do want to change that. Um, the other two areas I had... One we have no control over, as far as I can tell, and the other we have a lot of control over. So I'll start with the first one. There was discussion in here about coordinating with state agencies on various uh, transportation projects, WashDOT, City of Sammamish, on a local level. The one piece that I don't see in here is coordinating with the school district for the growth that's being planned, because the more residences and the more people we're bringing into the city to live here, it just seems to me that our Issaquah class schools are bursting at the seams. And I just look around and I see houses after houses after houses being built all throughout the city now. And if we're going to add all these trips, a lot of which will be residential trips or mixed use, we're adding more people. And more people means more need for schools. And especially with uh, the initiative concerning uh, class size that recently passed, there's going to be an enormous strain. And so I would just suggest as part of the whole coordinating with agencies and that sort of thing, that working very closely with the school district as this growth occurs is, is an important piece. And it's not necessarily a policy question, but more of a statement on, on that point. And then I have the second issue, which is a policy question, and it's going to relate to the funding. And I, I suspect that we're going to talk a lot later this evening about capital funding for these various projects. But as we learned last week, there is also a very significant personnel investment that needs to be made uh, to accomplish all of these projects. And I guess what I need to understand is how we pay for that. So we can use the impact fees, and then you're going to tell us some forms of taxation or related revenue sources that allow us to make up that remaining 70% of the share. But somewhere, you know, we, we can't do $100 million worth of road projects with the type of crew we have right now. And I don't mean the type, I mean the size of the crew we have. We have a very good crew. Um, you know, the, the scale of this is enormous. And I just don't know how we're going to pay for the staffing on top of the capital. And so that's a huge piece that I think needs to be talked about um, because if we adopt this as a policy model, we can come up with all the great ways to fund the capital, but if we don't have the personnel to get it done, we're going to end up relying on a lot of consultants, and no offense to consultants, but they're a lot more expensive than in-house uh, expertise on these types of things. So that's a big piece that I feel is still wanting here. Okay. Um, if I was, that, was there anything else? Is it, those that, are your that's what I have. So collaboration, just it's not so much a policy right. with the school district. When we look at financing, we need to consider staff 
requirements. And something about the 30 trip minimum, I forget. The safety and access, it sounds like we're not changing our policy on that. It would be a policy question if we wanted to change that. But I didn't hear anybody jump up and say we do, so. Yes, we act, the, the, the technical team actively talked about whether to change that threshold, eliminate it, increase it, decrease it, and we made an affirmative decision to stay at 30. Okay. Okay. Okay, so with that, I said earlier we're going to take a bio break. Just, do we have to? All I need is one affirmative. Okay, so when that clock and that big hand is on the nine, we're starting over. We'll take a break. Five minutes. Six, five minutes. And then we're going to come back and take audience comments. Okay, let's get going. So, um, we're going to open up. The council is very interested in getting comments from the public. Um, this is a great time to be here because we're still in policy formation. We haven't, we're not actually taking our votes on policy and things can still change. It's better than doing this in committee. It's a good time to speak. Uh, better than uh, regular business when things are much further down the line. So um, we're going to ask, um, first, are there any indication, is, is there anybody here who wants to make public comments? I see a couple hands. Okay. So that mic. Tell us about your association with the city. We're going to give you five minutes, regular rules as normally during our council meetings. So who is uh, who would like to go? Good evening, uh, David Cowboy, 255 Southeast Andrews Street. Um, I go along with the quasi grandfathering business in terms of. Uh, Grandfathering semi those those plats or whatever that have been uh, uh, that were the plat itself was grandfathered in but not the actual building. So that sense, makes sense. Um, I do support getting the um, the fees and building permit. If you come here and look at all the uh, double double, double trailer trailer mm -hmm. uh, dump trucks going by here all the time. No. Uh, those are all there's a lot of traffic impacts. That happen well before they even get building permits in terms of building the roads and all the rest that goes on in the property. So, uh, um, so the heaviest traffic impacts from a certain house or when it's being built, not even after it's occupied. So that money is needed as soon as possible. Um, I think people that choose to come, <coughs> people choose to come to Issaquah. Uh, here, I think, in some cases. Sorry, David. It's not working. I don't think I'm doing it. Um, <laughs> no, you're not. They're um, choosing to come here because of the parks. I mean, there's, you know, certain people, you, plus um, if you go to the community center and see all the, the young families there in the uh, 10, 10 a.m. to noon thing at the uh, community center, or you go to the, the different uh, playground stuff, a lot of those families are coming here to shop in his club because of the park. So it's, it's all tied together. So uh, fees for a park is tied to business is just a great idea. Um, there's been reference to King. There was reference to Wash Dot. There's not a whole. The biggest thing, one of the biggest things you should do is um, we'll lobby the state to deal with uh, uh, Highway 18. When there's a big cr a truck crash on Highway 18, then things really get bad in Issaquah. And as more and more of the ships go to Tacoma instead of Seattle, as Seattle screws up their waterfront with traffic for stadiums and all that, we can get more and more of that truck traffic is going to, it is the, I mean, it's just crazy on Highway 18 now with all those trucks coming out of the Minium from the port of Tacoma. If you see it, if you watch Puget Sound, the boats are, high percentage of those boats now go to Tacoma because they can get out of there. Is even with the existing Highway 18. So working with the state, trying to do something there would make a big difference on on, on traffic. And that's not going to be have much to do. It's just going to reduce uh, some of that um, regional traffic through here. It's not going to generate you any money. Uh, King County. I've talked had a long talk with the King County Council person after the uh, uh, Mountain Sound breakfast on, on Wednesday last Wednesday. 
the frustration King County has with the state on not being allowed to raise money for transportation in the county is great, very, very, very high frustration. So anything you can do with your lobbyists to work with allowing King County to allow changes in state law so King County can actually raise some money for transportation would be very, very beneficial for the city. Keeping their strong growth management so they don't keep putting too many people in the rural areas that require coming through here would also be good to support. The change of use thing is kind of interesting and I can understand why you're just kind of telling us it doesn't exist, but it's going to be interesting what it does to lease and rental structures on people that have large buildings because if you have a large space, let's say you're selling a mattress store as an example, they don't generate much traffic between 4 and 6 on Monday through Friday, but with that space it suddenly can become a high traffic generator without having to pay those fees, the owner of that building has got a pretty nice windfall in terms of what they can do for leasing it to a business that normally would be having to crank up the fees. Thank you. Thank you. Council members, my name is David Hoffman. I'm with the Master Builders Association of King and Sonoma Counties. I just have a few quick comments hopefully here tonight. I want to start by thanking you for taking the time to go over this as thoroughly as you are. It's a very complicated process as you know better than I. I've been doing this for 8 years and I'm not even close to understanding this process yet. So I'll start by, I guess, beginning these comments by saying it's important to recognize that new residents that are moving into new construction homes are essentially paying for this program twice. They're paying it for it through the impact fees and then whatever taxes the city chooses to implement to pay for the city's portion of it, they'll be paying those over time as well. So it's important to keep that in mind because typically what I have seen in a number of different jurisdictions is folks will get really excited about being able to, for lack of a nicer way to put it, stick it to development because they're going to come in and build in our city and we're going to be able to charge them a fee to do that. In the end, it ends up being paid by the new resident and then they also end up paying the higher taxes. So it's important to keep that in mind. As far as the specific items that you've been working through tonight, I have some very specific comments on those. Under J3, we're concerned with the idea that master builder members will be charged a fee in order to pay a fee. This happens in many different jurisdictions, but I'll still continue to beat the drum that we are very concerned that our members continue to have to pay a fee in order to figure out what kind of fee they have to pay later. It just sounds like double dipping to me. Regardless of the fact that the fee to figure out what your fee is is going to another fund to help update the system later. Regarding phasing the fees, I really appreciated the conversation that you all had this evening on that. There is precedence to phasing the fees. As of right now, the city of Bothell is looking at a very long-term phase-in for a much lower percentage increase in their impact fees for transportation. That's one example of a city today that's looking at this. They're looking at a 10% implementation of their higher fee or of the increase over the next five years and then readjusting their fees after that. So that's their Kirkland phased in Lake Washington School District's impact fees over the course of three years. We worked very closely with Kirkland on that and the school district and ended up coming to an agreement on that. We strongly believe that fees should be phased in or delayed to allow projects who are very close to submittal to be able to complete those projects. We're running into a number of cities today who are changing their zoning codes or changing tree regulations or in some cases fees. Because of these changes, projects are being stopped in their tracks. Projects that 
families are depending, in some cases, families who've been in, have been a part of communities for 100 years or longer. Um, one example in Renton, there's a family that had multiple builders lined up to build a, a project, and because a zoning code change was enacted um, through emergency, through an emergency clause, the project is dead. And they're no longer able to move forward to sell the land and pay, frankly, for their grandmother's uh, nursing home. Stay. So um, keep that in mind that there are real people that are affected. Your current citizens, your current property owners are going to be affected by this. Um, and, and that's just something to keep in the back of your, of your mind when it comes to the conversation about phasing this in. Although um, I personally have met with Charlie and Dave and, and Randy over the summer uh, multiple times to discuss uh, the concurrency uh, plan and the impact fee implementation, we haven't we didn't see these numbers until November. So saying that we've we've had many meetings is true, but it it strikes me as a little if, if we're going to use that as a justification to implement these very quickly that we've been meeting a number of times. It could be taken as a little disingenuous because we've been meeting and we've been having a really good conversation, and I appreciate that. We appreciate that, but. We didn't see these numbers until the second week of November. So we're still digesting them. Some of our members are really shocked by some of these numbers. So um, I just wanted to put that out there as well. And, and ask the question, will the city, have, and it sounds like the answer is no on this, but will the city have their portion of the funding for this um, CIP figured out by January 1st? Because the conversation took place tonight that if, if we're going to start the, the program January 1st, then the impact fees need to be implemented January 1st in order to start collecting those funds in order to implement the plan. But if the city doesn't have their 80% figured out, how can we, how can you implement the 20% uh, you know, January 1st without knowing what the 80% is? So i put that as, that as well. I would suggest linking the implementation of the fee to the adoption and implementation of the comprehensive plan, June 30th. Um, that makes sense, of course, from my perspective, that makes sense, uh, but it links it up with the, the timeline, the 2015 to 2030 comp plan timeline. Uh, that's all put that uh, food for thought on the table. Um, J6, we would be happy to continue that conversation. Um, I worked very closely with King County, Sammamish, Redmond, Newcastle, Kirkland, um, and a number of other jurisdictions on their um, adoption of delayed collection of impact fees. Um, and so I, I would be more than happy to continue that conversation. I'd like to speak um, to you one-on-one um, -on -one or in a small group about that. Um, it's, it's an option that some of our builders are continuing to use, but not everybody uses, uses it because it's not always necessary in all situations. This is something that for our smaller builders who may be building a, a four lot short plat, it may make sense because you're looking at a $30,000, $40,000 hit on, on transportation for impact fees. You may be able to put that off until closing, and there are ways that you can be assured that these fees will be collected. They're, they're there's very specific reasons why two of the largest counties in the state have adopted this and implemented it and are having no problems with it uh, currently. So, um, and then under J5, moving backwards, um, really do appreciate the accommodation to those projects um, which are all substantially complete. So, um, allowing those projects that may have preliminary plat approval or uh, are substantially complete beyond preliminary plat. Um, to be grandfathered into the uh, current fees, we uh, very much so appreciate that. So, with that, I'll wrap up my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who wish to make any comments? Anybody else? You, sir, want to make some comments? Hi. Thank you. My name is David Wagner. Um, my father's name is Rich Wagner. And he would have been here tonight, but he had some surgery on his foot. Um, I'm very new to development. Um, I've never done any development. <laughs> uh, my father has, though. He built um, two buildings in Issaquah. Um, one's called Issaquah Valley Place, the other one's called Issaquah Court. 
and they're both essentially on the first phase northwest on the Fiscal Bank Front Street. Um, one of them is an apartment building, the other one is in a condominium building, both in the streets. Um, I know that since we finished this support court, there's not been any development behind the front street on that street in 15 years. Um, he thinks it's because of the parking requirement um, that doesn't make development feasible. Um, we just uh, my name? <laughs> uh, purchased two lots um, between those two projects with the intention of building another apartment building. Um, we had a kind of just a preliminary casual meeting with Dave Baker. Um, this was several months ago. Um, and we've been slow in our process. Um, we learned about this about two weeks ago, about these learning meditation fees. And so since that time, we stopped um, our process with our architect. Um, you know, it, I, don't, I really don't know. We haven't studied this very deeply, but um, you know, the words that came out of my dad's mouth were, we may not be able to do this project, and we may need to just sell the lots because these fees may not pass it out for us. Um, when I was at the meeting last week, um, a thought that went through my mind was um, these fees for multi-family units are the same. But they're the same regardless of whether the unit is a 400 square foot studio or a 1500 square foot three bedroom, two bath apartment. Um, I would think that a large apartment is going to have kids and two cars and is going to have more of an impact on traffic and parks than a 400 square foot studio would. Um, but yet the fees are the same. Um, I think that's all. I, I, I have this, and I think this might, there might be a, something incorrect on here. Okay. Um, it just says that the parking pack fee is going down. It, it, it is. Okay. Well, that's good. I'm not, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that's all. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you very much. And, and the going down is because we're looking at charging non-residential departure for park. So we're just dis distributing the park impact <coughs> uh, wider. <coughs> okay, anybody else uh, here to make any comments? Okay, thank um, <coughs> uh, David, David, and David. Thank you. <laughs> we have three Davids. Okay. Okay. Yes, David, we've had enough Davids for this year. <laughs> <laughs> the next David's going to step up. This is David. Yeah. Funding? Funding. Funding. Okay, so oh, do you have a new deck for us? Oh, boy. So this is the first we're seeing this. This was not in the packet. Correct. This was not in the packet. Also, I refrain from bringing a water bottle up here. I may remember the slight disaster I caused last time I was gesturing all over the place. I was trying to electronics. So Is that why we have a new AV That's why you have a new AV So we're here to talk about funding strategies. Um, yes. And we have two topics. First, we're going to deal with parks. Um, and we're saving the more expensive and more challenging conversation of transportation for a second. So looking at parks, um, the proposed package of parks, this is pretty much unchanged from what we talked about at the November 10th meeting, is going to cost about $47 million worth of improvements. <coughs> and the share split is $30 million from growth and $17 million from other funding sources. So the question becomes, what do those other funding sources look like? So the $30 million from growth is the first row below the red. The red is the 47 cost. The, the, new, the impact fees at the new rates would generate $30 million. The other revenues are a small portion of the 2013 bond issue um, that will go into a few capacity projects. There's some others that are going into non-capacity projects. Um, 
And then in the middle is a large band of uh, continued sources and amounts. These are things you already have adopted, at rates you've already established. Money already flows from them in a variety of ways. You get re or sales tax money totaling about $5 million over this time period. But this is, by the way, a six-year plan corresponding with the six-year capital facilities plan. So if you subtract 2015 from 2020 and that's five years, it's because you would include 2015, which gets you to six years. So these are six-year numbers. In addition to the real estate excise and sales tax money, you get grants of about $2 million, interlocal revenues of about $2 million, things like the King County, uh, uh, I'm sorry. And then the last one is a combination of miscellaneous land sales and King County levy and interest totaling about a million. These amounts are based on looking at what you have successfully gotten over the last five years uh, or six years. So this is not expecting any increase or decrease in our performance. We might get a little bit more of one, a little bit less of other. It's a common practice for how we make an estimate of what these reasonably dependable revenue sources can generate. At the time I did this homework, I'm not sure that this is still an accurate number, there was approximately $2, $2 million cash balance in the park fund. And so that would be available to make a payment towards future capacity. So the total of all those revenues, including the $30 million of new impact fees, is $47 million. So, we don't think council has to do anything in order to make this a balanced program. We talked earlier about the policy question of the CIP having more like $100 million worth instead of $47 million. That doesn't affect this $47 million. If you then approve the whole $100 million, you need to find another $53 million. But we can fund the full sort of $47 million, and the only thing you have to do is adopt the new park impact fee. And you'll get $47 million either of the policy choices, either all residential, or smaller residential and small piece per business. Either one of them produces the 47 million, or the 30 million in impact fees. Questions about parks? Raising 30 million in impact fees in a six year window? Mm -hmm. okay. Oh, yeah. so I guess that just triggered a question for me, which is what level of development must occur in order to get us to $30 million in impact fees under the new rates? How many trips have to be bought out of the bank for this to work? So this is using the same growth forecast as the transportation forecast. We're totally consistent. And so this is a six-year slice of the 15-year slice of the total development. The transportation piece is a 15-year plan, 2015 to 2030. This is about a third of that. So it's it's as aggressive or as reasonable, whichever adjective you prefer, as the transportation one is. If you like transportation growth rates, you're going to love the park one. If you have concerns about the transportation growth rates, and I've heard a little bit of that, then you would have the same concern here. These numbers match that pace of performance. I was just more getting at sort of the, the nuts and bolts of, you know, Obviously, it's based on the, the averages and so forth of, of the types of development, so maybe it's hard to give an answer, but you know, if one development comes in, I guess it's big enough, it could pay you know, $30 million in impact fees, take up you know, a quarter of the city or something. I mean, what I'm getting at is how much growth would we have to see in a six-year period to, to actually achieve this goal? Do, do like five new businesses have to open up? Do we have to get 20 new businesses yeah, brought the, in? The business piece of this is less than 10%, it's about okay. 10%. So out of, out of the 30 million, 27 million of it's coming from residential. So how many houses do we need to the, get? The same number that you need to generate the 8,000 trips for transportation. I, I, unfortunately, I don't have that okay. at the top of my head. I'll okay. get it for you. Okay. Um, all I can say tonight from my a rapidly fading recollection of those numbers is that it's consistent. Okay. Any other questions about the park, please? Then let's turn our attention to transportation. Same kind of slide, total cost and a growth share and another funding share. This is, of course, a much larger number, $304 million. We're going to break that down into the two pieces, the transportation or roads and streets piece, and then the bike and pet piece. Okay? This is the total of the two. And growth share is about 113 million, and the other funding source is 191. <coughs> so let's break down the cost part of it and and its relationship to money. We're going to do the traffic piece first. <coughs> and for the members of the infrastructure committee, this was Randy's experiment at the whiteboard. These are the same numbers, so you're already ready for the test. You'll have to be open book test for the rest of the class. Um, 
We start with a total cost. These are numbers in the rate study, uh, $255 million worth of roads and streets, traffic impact fee improvements. Six million of the 255 million is an existing deficiency. And so we're gonna have to subtract that. And, and we covered that in the, what color should we call that? Not green. Mauve green, what? Not green. Yellow. Not green? Yellow. Yellow, we'll call that yellow, okay? So the six million in deficiency, we'll call it yellow, has to be paid by somebody other than new development. Okay? Anything up there that's yellow is other funding. And it's tempting to call it the city share, but the city share includes grants, so it isn't necessarily city money or city taxpayer money, so I don't want to fall into that trap, it's just other funding. Uh, the other thing we're going to subtract at the top is we have $26 million in commitments from development that hasn't occurred, and they're going to come and draw down some of those 8,600 trips, uh, um, 8,400 trips from the trip bank, but they haven't paid us yet, and they're in, on paper going to pay us, you just approved a very large development agreement with Costco. That's where most of that money is coming from. So we're taking off the top because they'll have already paid for $25 million, but we can't charge them again for it. We can't charge anybody else again for their contribution. And <clears throat> their piece is not $26 million. It's a little less than that. There's a few million dollars in there of, of rally money. Those are the two principal sources. So we have $223 million that could be looked at as does growth pay a share and does growth not pay a share. And the first thing we have to switch to is the internal and external um, discussion that we've had before with Torsten and with me. And <clears throat> this is where we've identified that um, $41 million on the right is the portion of the cost associated with external trips. So they're not going to pay us. Okay? We don't have a cash register for them. Somebody has to pay for them because they're using our city streets. The remaining 182 million on the left are internal trips. And so these are folks that can be asked to pay, can be required to pay. But we split that into two pots, a growth cost and an other funds cost. And the vocabulary I used with the infrastructure committee was vested and not vested. Not in a legal sense of vesting, but um, the, the growth cost on the left side, the green box, the 64 million, that's not vested growth that's going to come to us and they will have to pay. On the right side, the other funds, the 119 million, that's development agreement growth, okay? They are already committed to paying a lower amount because when they got their development agreements approved, we hadn't figured out that there was a central support plan. We hadn't figured out that we needed to charge five or $6,000 a trip. We were approving them at $1,000 or $1,500 a trip, okay? They didn't get a bargain. They just signed up for what you asked for at that time. And that's what you knew you needed at that time, and so it was a fair deal to all parties. Now we have a way bigger list, but when they come in and start pulling building permits, they're gonna hold up the development agreement and say, this is what I agreed to pay, you agreed that that's all I had to pay. But we're gonna need another $119 million over and above that. So that becomes the responsibility of us to find it, whether it's the local taxpayers or grants or whatever combination. We're gonna get to that in a minute. What are, what are your choices? So this is the traffic portion of the $300 million program. Let's look at the bike ped piece. Same format, smaller costs. $49 million total, no existing deficiency, a very small amount of commitments that are out there for the bike ped projects of two million. So 47 of the 49 million we need to develop. Bike ped trips are all local. Okay? That doesn't mean that no bicyclist has ever ridden outside this, the uh, Isaguan. But for the purposes of our transportation network and reliable transportation, those are statistically insignificant, and so we don't count them in our model. We're saying that all trips for the pedestrian and all bicycle trips for the purposes of this mitigation are considered internal trips. So we don't have a problem that we have to pay for the external trips. That's not why we made that decision. It's because statistically we can't validate enough external bicycle trips to make it worth doing the math. So if all 47 million have to come from somebody, we did the allocation of what's the growth share and what's our share. And as you saw in the mitigation nexus study, we used an analysis of what growth will look like in the future, in the year 2030. And we figured out what the current population is as a share of that, 55%, and what new development will be as a percent of that, 45%. And so 
The $47 million is divided into 45% for growth, that's the 21 million, and 55% for those of us who are already here, that's the 26 million. Quick question on the color. There, the commitment says green, but I think on the other slide it was yellow? Uh, no, the, the yellow on the previous slide was, was the, the deficiency. deficiency. Okay. And there's no deficiency in bike pad. Correct. In a way, there's a, there's a different kind of deficiency. It's the fact that 55% of the funding has to come from existing residents. So whether you call it deficiency or an upgraded system that we're paying for, it will fill in the blanks for us as, as well as paying for the, and then growth will pay for its share. I'm sorry, Mandy, I didn't follow. We have no deficiency, yet there is an outstanding balance by the, the current users, the current residents of 26 million. I'm sorry, either I wasn't listening or um, no, I, I, th I think you're I think you're you're spotting a nuance in this that, that um, I could answer this way. I would be almost as comfortable taking the 26 million and pushing it up to the deficiency pot. Right? It's 26 million that we have to pay for for ourselves. We cannot attribute 100 percent of the cost of all these bike pet improvements. You've seen the project list, 16 or so projects. Um, clearly, those projects are being built because we want to attract development in a high density mode, and they'll they'll use it. They won't be the only users. Existing residents will use it. And so we think the safest way to protect the defensibility of this fee is to acknowledge that we get the same amount of benefit proportional to population as they get. Remember, this is a SEPA-based fee. We've never been sued on our existing SEPA-based fees. I wouldn't want this to be the first one, but I'd want us to be rock solid. And if we get sued, the question will be, can you demonstrate that this is a direct, specific, adverse impact created by my development? If we acknowledge that 55% of the problem goes with us, we go a long way to saying you're just paying your share. So we've seen the two slides of the, of the traffic and the, and the bike pit uh, separately. Next slide's going to be exactly the same format. We're just simply going to add the two slides together. Okay? Total of both of them combined, 304 million. The deficiency, the commitments, the external, which is all the traffic piece, the internal that's a mix of both, growth costs, other costs. And so, growth is going to pay the commitments piece and the growth cost piece, 113 million out of the 304 million. Okay? That's why I said earlier it was about a third. Um, and the other two thirds, the other 191 million, is the piece that we need to figure out. So when we've been talking to each other about 119 million, a problem we had to solve, that was from two slides ago. Okay. We've always had the 119 million and we've stayed <coughs> focused on it together. What we haven't done until tonight is to get the total amount of that, including the bike pit piece, okay, and including the deficiency piece, and including the external trip piece from the traffic. So now let's talk briefly about what our opportunities are. I'm going to show you two slides. Yes, go ahead. That's I still ask a question. Okay, so if so, our uh, impact fees are a certain amount, five thousand. Mm -hmm. If the impact fees were ten thousand dollars per whatever, does that also include if if so that would include growth cost? Does it proportionally increase the other funding cost? No. If, if your fee was, well, I, maybe I'm not understanding the question. Are you assuming if that the $10,000? If we set the fee at 5000 or 10000 rather than 5000 right. okay. what happens to You don't it? have that option. Well, okay. No, I was right. just trying to... to be a spoils for it. <laughs> what, I have, what I have calculated for you is the legally defensible maximum amount that you can charge under one. Okay, the okay. The two then uh, say we only charge 2000 Does that decrease our number? Uh, if we only charge 2000 and we keep the project list the same, then it increases the yellow and decreases the green. So if you go anything less than what I've calculated as the maximum allowable, basically you're saying, okay, growth, we want you to pay, but maybe a little less, and we'll pick up the difference. The only way to avoid that happening, the only way to charge growth a little less and charge you a little less is to reduce the project cost and just say, well, we're just not going to do some of those projects. And if we don't do some of those projects, then the person will get to prepare a new level service chart for us because more intersections are going to get busted. Yes? 
your external box up here, mm -hmm. I'm not sure I understand that. Is it the, um, we had the conversation earlier about the, you know, the six E and F intersections. And we talked about external trips. Mm -hmm. Is that, that's, that's, it's a different definition. It isn't those six or seven. Um, it goes back to, I don't know if we want to hit the kind of fire up course in slideshow. Let me try, let me try a word picture and see if it re brings back the recall from November 10th. Um, we had a part of the, the, the uh, slide presentation in which we showed a diagram that showed all the different combinations of trips from existing to existing, from new to new, from vested to vested. And then we flipped another chart that said from internal to internal, internal to external, and external. You know, we had all the combinations up there, and there were 29,000 trips in different combinations. And when we got to, to dissecting those trips, we identified those trips which were external in nature. And as I um, re responded not too long ago to one of Erkmeyer's earlier questions, we have different rules for how to treat the external trips. For concurrency, the external trips don't even exist in our trip bank because we, we're not permitting any of those. But for impact fees, some of them are coming in and using our streets, and so I have to calculate them as part of the equation. So they're going into how much we charge the impact fee for, but we're not going to get an impact fee from them because they're being permitted for development by a neighboring jurisdiction. So they wind up in our external box. They have to be paid for, and we wind up paying for them. So if that helps. Much. Okay, so, okay. They're an impact. They originate externally. Yes. And that external jurisdiction is collecting an impact. Them, but we're not. Or, or not. Or so not. So but we have no opportunity to. Correct. Okay. okay. Now, there are some rare instances in which jurisdictions have partnered and do what are called reciprocal impact fees. And so, you would charge a fee for your, the impacts of Issaquah development on Renton, and you would send some money to them. And Renton would figure out how much of their trips were winding up in Issaquah, and they would charge it, they'd raise their fee and charge a traditional amount and send you some money. You would do the same thing with Sammamish, with the, the county. Okay? There's very few of them out there. They're very complex and very poor. So they are related to growth? Okay. Yeah. So they're trips related to growth, but they're, uh, they're, we, we cannot collect right. them. They're growth related. These are not external regional trips that are already out there. These are more new external regional trips coming from external growth. Okay, external growth. I think we, I think we were trying to say the same thing with each other. Okay. We both envision that it is new trips, not existing, and it's trips because of development that somebody else is approving that we don't. Okay. Okay. So let's look in two slides to they're all about growth. of ways to pay for all those. Okay. <coughs> First, we're going to start with, like we did with parks, stuff we're already doing. So we don't have to do anything new except adopt the new fees. So <coughs> total cost, $304 million. Growth at the new rates, plus the commitments from that old rates, I really didn't word that one very well, is the $113 million. That was the green box in the lower right here. Okay, so growth will pay its full share of the 304 million. We have some other money available, not a lot. Um, we had um, the city's transportation grants uh, specialist uh, Gary Costa did a really detailed analysis of every project on our list: which ones are eligible for grants, which one are we likely to be competitive, and which ones we are likely to win. And that's what the 86 million dollars is. Remember, this is over a 15-year period. Um, you also have some real estate excise tax money that you put in. And so working with Diana on what the historical amounts are and just assuming we stay at that and increase or decrease the, the amount that goes to transportation <coughs> stays about the same, we figure another $8 million. Uh, there's like a million dollars cash balance in the mitigation fund. Uh, I'm not sure whether that's committed to things that we have on a new list or maybe to something old, but it's only a million dollars, so it's not going to make a big difference in our discussion tonight. I'll have that perfected when I'm talking about the after the meeting. So if I subtract all the black numbers from the red at the top, the good news is we covered about two-thirds of it. The bad news is 
The number you've been saying all along, 118 million, 118 million, that's the old number. The number you need is 96. Okay, this is numbers where you would have to take action. Six years? 15 years. Oh, oh, all right, that's an error. That should be the 2030. Okay. Yep, that's good catch, fine. thank you. Um, so now we do have to talk about what else could you do to find these other funds. Okay. And the answer is, there are lots of painful possibilities. <laughs> if they were easy, you would have already done them. Okay. Um, I'll walk you through the five things that are listed up there. Uh, but I'm going to start with the punchline. You need 96 million, and if you had the ability to do all of these at all of the rates I'm suggesting, which would be really painful, you could actually generate more than double what you need. There's $206 million worth of capacity there. Okay? So where's the capacity coming from? Well, if you did a transportation benefit district and went to the voters and asked them for the statutory maximum rate, not the $20 that you can adopt as a council, but ask them to approve the whole $100 a year, you could generate $48 million over this time horizon. And, and I noticed on this slide I did get the time horizon right. <laughs> um, another thing you could do, as Renton and Redmond have both done, is to negotiate with the business community to identify transportation projects that benefit businesses for which businesses are willing to pay a business license fee. So instead of having a business and paying 50 bucks a year, if you're Microsoft and Redmond, you have a business and you pay $100 per employee per year. Okay. And I put in a $50 rate here because both Renton and Redmond over the years have negotiated from what was originally pure transportation at about $50. They've increased to now $100. My business is in Redmond, so I pay that $100 per person fee for that. And 50 of it stays with transportation. So I've got a $50 per FTE is full-time equivalent employee. So if you have a business with two half-time employees, you would pay $50. That would generate about $19 million over the 15-year period. The next item is a recent success story from the city of Kirkland. They went to their voters and said, property taxes. We would like a permanent levy lid lift devoted to transportation in the amount of 20 cents per hundred per thousand dollars of value. And they did a really good job of explaining where it would go. They had a lot of different improvements all over town. They had a combination of capacity fixes and, in, in their case, some uh, repairs and, and uh, some non-motorized stuff. And for you, that would generate, with no change in assessed value, about $18 million over the 15 year period. Um, you could go to the voters and ask for approval of voter approved bonds. Um, even going to 50% of capacity is pretty darn high, but uh, Diane knows me well enough that I would never dare mention 100% or 95%. So if you compare your current, voting, your current bond capacity and have the voters approve 50% of that, you could generate $85 million. They would also be approving a property tax to repay that for the life of the bond. The last one is instead of a vehicle license fee or in addition to a vehicle license fee because the transportation benefit district actually allows you to do both you can ask the voters to approve the two tenths of a percent sales tax increase um, of the nearly 40 35 jurisdictions in washington that have transportation benefit districts um, about two-thirds of them have the vehicle tab but only at the 20 dollars level they didn't take it to the voters and about a third of them went to the voters for the two tenths of a percent sales tax. And, and it's, it was uh, amazing to me that they, well, virtually all of them got approval. Only two of them have been turned down. Uh, that would generate $36 million. So the possibilities are there for $200 million when your needs are $96 million. But I did say earlier that your needs for transportation don't include that's our 900 pallets, don't include Sunset, don't include Sheldon's list of $47 million worth of stuff that doesn't have capacity for anybody, it's just fixing your current roads. So you probably need more than 96, or you need to not ever take care of any other problems except what we've got in front of you. I don't think that's realistic. Um, this, I said candidly, this is gonna be painfully possible because nobody likes to see their taxes go up, and it won't be easy for council to make choices but they're legally available to you, and I just want to leave you with that thought as we move into next year. I know you've been asked about, well, don't you have to do this before you adopt the fees? No. You need to have a sense of whether you can get there. If you were all laughing up your sleeve going, we're not going to do any of this, um, you know, I wouldn't want to have that on a public recording because you wouldn't be able to defend your impact. 
But as long as these are realistic and possible and you have the conversation and you start making some progress on it, one of the reasons you don't have to have this locked in before you adopt the fees is because we can capture these amounts in less than the 15-year time period by simply charging a higher rate for a shorter period of time on some of them or accelerating the amount of, of uh, you know, changing the rate on the business license fee instead of $50, we make it $60 and collect it for 14 years instead of 15. So there are ways to adjust some of these. Some of them are not so adjustable. We can't exceed the sales tax or the vehicle tax amounts. Okay, I've worn you off. I've given you the picture. It is possible to get there. So I'll just leave you with that and take any questions. None of this has any of Diane's approval, but she has seen them all and she knows that they are reasonably accurate representations of what you can do. I've not asked her for a recommendation. Silence is stunning. Oh, I have a comment. I guess I have a comment. Um, or I do you have a comment? It's, it's easy when we look at the numbers that we need to um, somehow say, well, if we don't do something, then we don't have to do this. But I think the reason we're here and the reason we're looking at the need to generate money for transportation projects is because. Um, we have been woefully lacking in making some of these hard choices for a long time. Yes, correct. So um, I'm uh, personally excited that we're at this point. I know they're 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 big dollar amounts, but they're just going to get larger, and we're just going to dig a bigger hole for ourselves if you don't take some significant steps forward, make some difficult decisions um, to make some things happen. It's just we've done so little for so long that now we're looking at big numbers. And done little for long during a time in which your growth targets and your transportation needs were pretty modest. And now we have a much more well thought out, council supported, recent plan, central Issaquah plan that says we want to have more development. And so it's a much more expensive fix to take care of that. I'm using that statement as a reminder to wrap up my presentation that this is one of three ways to come to closure on everything we've been presenting to you for the last year. One way is to step up and come up with funding. There are two other alternatives we've talked about it before. We're going to just analyze them one more time. We can take the chart of many colors and have lots more reds and yellows on it. That reduces the cost, which means we don't need as many new revenues. Conceivably, we could get it down to where we need no new revenues. But the, fee, the, the smaller amount of new money that you bring in, the more that right-hand chart is going to have, instead of six yellows and reds, it's going to have seven and eight and 10 and 17. And it's, okay, it's going to get really ugly. But that is a solution, except more congestion even though we have a lot of folks who aren't happy with the congestion today. We should have been at the open house when I did my guess how long it takes to sit through one intersection and get a level of service D. I think the audience was rather surprised with how, how much time it took at one intersection. There is another alternative, but it runs totally contrary to the very careful planning effort you've just engaged in within the last two years. And that's to say, yeah, Central Issaquah, we didn't mean it. We don't want to be a regional center. Because if we substantially reduce our growth, not below our regional share, but if we don't take the direction we've gone, fewer people, fewer trips. Fewer trips, fewer busted intersections, reduces the cost. So you have those other two ways out, and I don't think you're real excited about either of them, but I just want to be very transparent with you and pretty much on your behalf to the public that there are choices here and there are hard choices. Could you, could you flip back? I'll tell you where to stop. Right there. So the external, and back to that, okay. how much of that, the, 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 the scale of that is a reflection of our current planned job and, and, job and uh, population growth? The 41. Yeah. I mean, I, I understand it's growth outside yeah. our jurisdiction, uh, trip originating outside, but it's coming into there. It's growth related from another jurisdiction. But how much is our current... Um, you know, plan for growth uh, affecting that number. 
So back to your the, the third alternative you just said. Say, you know what, let's actually reduce the growth plans down to our regional commitment. Right. Right. Would that number change? Yes. Um, because a few of our trips are external when they leave Issaquah and go someplace else. Those external trips are not 100% uh, derived just from folks coming into Issaquah from the outside. We also have a small number of them that are people here, living here, and working somewhere else. So the internal part of their trip is living here, the external is when they arrive at one. And I don't have the split in the division of that. Okay, keep, keep it on this slide. And so, um, again, this package of projects, which total costs that we have here, again, it's just related <coughs> to uh, those projects. And I think I heard you say a moment ago that Sheldon has another list of $47 million yes. of the projects that exist, <coughs> existing deficiencies. That's the rest of his TIP projects. That didn't pass, the, didn't make it to to our list of projects needed to grow. They're not all repair projects. Some of them are capacity projects. <coughs> that one, Torsten did his first run, and it was um, not all that expensive, but it was kind of didn't solve everything. It's because we were spending money on projects that didn't we don't level the service. They they built some history to them, and they were still in your TIP. That's there's some of those as well as some non capacity projects. It's a mix. I couldn't tell you what it's doing. If we change our TIP next year, that number could change. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it could become 4.7 million. But I'll let Sheldon defend that number. Well, okay. So, so I guess what's, that's really startling to me when I look at this is the ratio between the deficiency and the external. The impact. I, I, I was under the impression the deficiency was even larger. Well, a reminder that the deficiency column is the first column over there. Mm -hmm. That's today's deficiency, not what will become deficient. Mm -hmm. And there's only four intersections that are a problem on there. And three of them are going to be designated as our amongst our six level of service um, ENF projects because they're so impossible to solve that we're actually going to be making some investments in three of them, but they won't be enough to get them back up to level of service D. They'll be remain in year. But they're still important to us, and we may talk to our regional partners. They're important enough that. to us that we're going to make an investment in them. They just won't fix it to the level we want. We have other, whatever you're ready, I think there's okay. some other. So um, I don't think this is the same question that you asked. So if you backed out the central plan and the projects associated with that, so if we went, so if we rolled back a couple of years and we were having the same conversation. We were looking at the same chart, and we had, and there was a number. What the city had, the, the city's share of whatever. Do you have any sense of what that number would be? I, I don't think that I want to do any guessing. Okay. Um, I, I'd be willing to try and figure it out, at least ask, give you an estimate. Um, don't take I just made a commitment. I'm not writing it down. Thank you. Um, because I think that's. That's an interesting question because you know it's easy to assume that the central plan is driving the big numbers, and I don't know if that's true. Well, I would remind you something Torsten said earlier this evening, um, which was is that if we had stayed with the old growth plan, it was going to be more expensive. And I asked, well, isn't that because this traffic is spread out, and so you'd have to fix more intersections? And he said, yeah, that was part of it. We also reminded us that in Central Issaquah Plain, we get to use both sides of the street right. throughout the day. Whereas by spreading people out, there's not only more intersections, but all the streets that they are using, we're only counting half of it during the peak, PM peak hour for most of the streets. And those two things together probably made the old plan more expensive, I think is what the person said, than what we're looking at now. Well, I, I'm, and the more I think about it, the more I think that 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 is a question that maybe we should have some sort of an answer to, so that we know. Um, I just, I just think it's a good question. It, we will definitely make a very serious, <coughs> excuse me, a very serious attempt at estimating. Okay. The one thing that we're not in a position to do, if it turns out we can't get a good estimate, is we're not in a position to run another traffic model to okay. try and figure it out this sure. decision. But I think we can get you part way to a reasonable professional judgment on that. Thank you. Josh, question. So, 
you know, we're, we're doing this survey, getting information from the public, and I know, Miranda, you mentioned that other jurisdictions have successfully passed the types of voter-approved uh, levies and taxes and so forth, and, and I guess, you know, one of the things that's, that's holding me up at this juncture is the idea of knowing what the level of public support is for these options, because before being asked to make a commitment to a very large number, there's some things that are on faith, and I, I think the grant funding is somewhat on faith. You know, there's a, a reasonable expectation of getting the grants, but you know, we just adopted a 2015 budget with a transportation project that was based on receiving a grant at Dogwood, and then we just found out we didn't get that. And now here we are with a budget that commits to a project that we can't fully fund unless we ship some dollars around. So I'm not sure I can jump on board and say all of those grants, that $86 million in grants, is for sure money in the bank. So maybe it's $96 million plus some amount where we don't succeed in getting grants. Could happen. Maybe it pushes us over 100 Maybe it doesn't. But for those five funding sources on that chart, the fifth funding source being business-related, doesn't even come close to paying for the 96 million. So the other four funding sources, I'm, I'm trying to get a sense of, you know, we, we taxed ourselves and everybody liked it when we did the pool, uh, not the pool, the parks bond, um, you know, for that, okay. Prop one for transit, I'm not sure there was really that much support on the east side, I'm not sure where Issaquah stood as a community on uh, the transit prop one. Uh, you know, what is the public appetite for imposing multiple layers of taxation on themselves uh, in order to fund these projects. Because if we as a council make a commitment, but then the public comes back and says, no, we're not gonna do that, we have a huge gap. We have a gap bigger than the gap for the Costco development where we needed to come up with you know two million or so dollars to make the North Issaquah Roadway Network work. We're talking about tens upon tens, if not over a hundred million dollars by the time we're all done. Now granted, it's spread over, say, a 30-year period of time, but again, if the public doesn't authorize this type of taxation, the trip bank is going to be open. The bank is, the bank's open for business, the checks are being written, the development's coming, and those cars are pouring out of driveways onto our roads. But we're not going to have the infrastructure to catch up to it. And that's the point I raised earlier this evening, that on day one, the bank is open, the buildings are being built. Can we keep up with that level, that capacity? And again, we still don't have the staffing uh, uh, issue here addressed, which is how many people does it take to build that many millions of dollars of projects? And what other type of investment does the city have to make just in people hours to make this all happen as well? Because that has a number behind it too. Okay. One of, the, uh, one of the questions I just asked Randy, and he said he was going to try to give us a reasonable answer, is um, what is the city's responsibility no matter what? So you roll back a couple of years, and it's, it's not um, the s citizens of this law, the community is going to have to pay to fix the deficiencies that are there already. So, I mean, we have existing deficiencies that have to be paid for. And um, so, not, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but I don't know that we have to know what the community's appetite is for taxing themselves or paying for it, because I think they're speaking already. I mean, it's the number one problem for 15, 20 years in the city. And this, if, whether it's 96 million or 55 million or 300 million, at some point we have to dig ourselves out and we have to, and we have to pay for it somehow. Um, Based on our current adopted level of service, yes, we do eventually have to pay for our existing problems and deficiencies. Just because it's a number one problem, I'm not sure it means the public is willing to tax itself to the extent shown here, and I don't know the answer to that. 
And we're assuming that well, this is a much bigger deficiency because we don't have Randy's number yet of what it would be. So it may be the same whether we have this, whether we go this route or whether we look at the, I'm not saying that the right way. But I think your, I think your comments and um, um, assume that this is, that this is the worst case scenario and that it's much worse than the numbers that, the number that Randy's going to bring at some point that gives us. Right. So I mean, I'm not sure that it is. At, at the end of the day, there will be new growth. We can assess approximately 30% of that bike pet plus transportation on the growth, but that growth is also going to create a much higher percentage of new traffic above and beyond existing deficiencies, new trips on the road, up to 8,000 new trips, and our citizens are going to have to foot the bill for over 70% of that. So we're, we're going to assess the growth, 30% of what they're bringing in, but then we're going to turn around and, and tax our citizens 70% of what somebody else is bringing to them. I think the point I'm hearing, though, is that if we don't do this plan, we're still going to have 8,000 trips spread out all over town. And it's going to cost at least as much, or in Torsten's informal estimate, possibly more, to fix that many more locations. That's that's what I promised that we'll, we will estimate. But Torsten's already shared with us that he believes that to be the case. So I'm I'm just we're going to look for you, but I'm doubtful that we'll come back and go, oh, wow, there is a cheaper way out of this, and it's the old growth plan. And, and that brings me back to some of the the buyer's remorse, I guess, on on the central area plan and adding 8,000 trips. And, and not having the capacity in the city or the ability to fund that capacity. Um, it, it's just shocking to me, the, the idea of build, 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 it's chicken and egg. Do you build the infrastructure first or do you grow first and the infrastructure comes later? And, and I'm just not seeing how we can fund the infrastructure later when on day one the bank is open and you can just start the growth. Well, I know. Your current concurrency system does worse than that. But what you do right now is you let a developer come in you run a traffic model in which they identify one intersection that they may break, and that's all they ever have to fix. And they don't have to fix it right away. And you're allowing all those trips on the road and getting no contribution to the rest of the system. And I didn't say I like that system very much. Okay. Nine of them. Thank you. This uh, conversation has gotten even better than I thought it might be tonight. Uh, and I, uh, my major concern going in tonight was the uh, proportional share that is uh, are we calling them now? Not the city's share, but other funding. And uh, uh, other funding, it is interesting to say it, it's so ambiguous, but there is, it is a, you say it, it's, you could say part of it is a city share and part of it comes from other funding sources, but as Josh so uh, aptly put it, it still all comes from the citizens, whether we're citizens of the city of Issaquah, citizens of the state of Washington, or the United States, the grant money it's still, it's coming from us, no matter where you're getting it, it's just to, it's how it's spreading it out. So the other funding is coming from, from us, the people who aren't building a commercial or a um, real estate or whatever it is, the reason for their development. And what I think is really exciting about the discussion tonight, uh, I didn't have a solution. I just had frustration when I came earlier. But to find out how much of this is being driven by the um, upper levels of this uh, Central Issaquah plan growth. Now we have growth that we're required to take that any city needs to take on as part of the Growth Management Act, but we have increased our growth objectives because of the Regional Growth Center for one. Now if that was exciting, but not exciting enough that we want to pay that much for it. Thank goodness we're talking about it now. Uh, it does seem a little late, but it's not too late to talk about whether we've gotten ourselves into a corner. To your point a moment ago, Randy, it, uh, I, I wish we could say, hey, yeah, we've got to change our impact fees for, for building, but do we keep the growth projections that we're um, committing to, because once this, I can't remember, I was trying to find it before I started talking, the, uh, the part of the policy says that we are committed to pay for it. Once we start this, it, it's, that, those, that's, the, uh, that's the bill, and, I, and I'm worried about that. So I would propose two ways of looking at this. One is 
do we really want to take on all that growth that people were excited about before they knew the bill? Number two is the Central is a club plan that's assuming a pedestrian friendly community. And if you think of on the edges of that, Paris, New York, whatever, how many reds do they have? Do we need to decrease the level of service even more if we're trying to create a local pedestrian area? Two other options to perhaps decrease the dollar values. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I wanted to add that when I did support the Central Issaquah area plan, I think it was very clear to me about what that growth was. I knew that infrastructure improvements were going to be required, and I knew that we didn't yet know how they were going to be paid for. But it was important to have a plan, and have a plan that we believed in and I believed in actually was going to bring significant benefit to the city, and also believed that it could be done in such a way to preserve existing neighborhoods and the quality of life that we have, and yet add infill in the area where we could afford to do it in the Central area. So the question, I'm actually kind of surprised that anybody can say they're surprised at the number. We've known there was going to be a number since we adopted the Central Issaquah plan. We absolutely knew there was going to be a number. And so I'm kind of in the boat where, okay, now I know what our tough next decisions are. You're absolutely right. Whether you're a resident of the nation or the state or the county or the city, we're paying one way or the other, because Saudi Arabia is not giving us money to build our roads. I mean, it's going to come from with us. So you're absolutely right about this. But I look at this and say, okay, now there's some detail that's showing up. The next questions that we need to ask are becoming clear. But, and yeah, absolutely, I don't, until you take a vote, you don't know the vote. You don't know, really. But we now have levers or options that we can work with to formulate questions. And honestly, when I proposed, along with Stacey earlier this year, to develop what we call the Master Transportation Plan, now called the Master Mobility Plan, I mean, I was anticipating something like this. But then making a project out of it and saying, let's add parking in the Old Town area. Let's actually roll up our sleeves and develop a strategy for how we, you know, what projects we do, but also let's develop a strategy for how we fund it. Because what's not on that list? I mean, it was mentioned earlier by David from Master Builders that, you know, the county is saying, and I've heard this for a long time too, hey, state, give us some local transportation funding options. That's not on there. So another part of our strategy could be, you know, we do need to lobby heavier for other options from the state, for example. And there may be other legislation that doesn't exist as well too. But to me, when we proposed creating a Master Mobility Plan as a goal, it wasn't, I knew we were going to get some numbers. We were going to have an idea of how big it was and how it was going to cost. And we said, let's commit ourselves to developing a strategy on how going about that. And this list of things, I mean, yeah, TIB up to the maximum, you know, per vehicle tap per 100, you know, that's actually, you know, the TIB option I've been aware of for a while. It happens to be one of the most regressive form of taxes. So, you know, that's not what I'm thrilled about. But those are the conversations I think that's what we now need to have. Unless we say, no, stop, dial back the growth. And I'm not ready to do that. We're just getting started on the planning. And I mean, we were anticipating these tough questions all along. I mean, I knew we were, you know, in 2012, I knew we were going to be faced with this type of information. We got more detail. Now we can move to the next level and develop a strategy for how we want to address that. Yeah, you know, it's so, so I've also read a study that 
was a little bit of incur is encouraging. At least it was a summary that um, I think it's available on MRSC, the uh, uh, Municipality Research Service Center, whatever that it stands for, about um, um, uh, attributes of successful uh, voter-approved initiatives for funding. And actually, there's pretty there's some pretty clear good ways to do it and wrong ways to do it. And what's the things that stand out to me, and I think vo traffic related voter approved initiatives pass at a rate of like 72%. And some of the more the key attributes are is that there's a very clear result. There's something very literally concrete that we're achieving. Unlike, hey, we're going to maintain your bus service. That didn't work. And the public was very clear about that. You know, that was a very clear lesson. So, so you know, I've been collecting that information and think about this, you know, over the years. So, so now we've got it. So, and, and we can now we have a basis upon which we can develop a strategy. Um, and, and so, um, I guess I've looked at this as um, uh, that, you know, it's one of the reasons I wanted to get into public service is that the quality of life and especially that the transportation's impact to this has been is if we don't plan it and manage it and have a strategy and execute the plan, it, it's never going to get better. It's only going to get worse. And we absolutely are not going to build a place that my kids are going to want to inherit. And that's still what I want to build. So if four of the five options require voter approval, putting aside the idea that the legislature is going to somehow come down and give us more options when it has to fund under McQuarrie, I don't see that coming. But if four of these five options require voter approval, then why wouldn't it be prudent to go to the voters before adopting a plan that incurs the bill? I mean, you, you typically know what you're buying when you go into a restaurant before you order the meal and eat it. So I would want to know what, what the public is willing to do, what is the public's appetite for taxing itself, you know, when, or, or before we even get to the vote, you know, we did a study on the park bond that gave us a pretty high confidence level that a bond of this size for these types of projects, the public would support. And lo and behold, the, the polling data turned out correct. But before we commit ourselves January 1 or shortly thereafter to a course of action that incurs a very large dinner bill, I would want to know, do we have the money to pay for that bill? Actually, so that's and that's a fair question. That, that, I, I understand that. Excuse me, Randy. And I and I'm I'm thinking there's 12 to 18 months of effort to do that. I tell you what, this is really complex, and and we don't know. You know, you know, you can't ask the public to spend 40 hours like we have on this to understand everything. You know, it's going to have to work. There's a bit of work on what the package is, and that's my whole point. We don't know what the strategy is yet. You know, that actually adds up to 206, right? Well, we're not going for 206. We're just not going to, right? But, you know, but, but I, I mean, I think there's just, there's still quite a bit of work that would have to go into what mix and what new. Because I, uh, because honestly, I've heard quite a bit and some from sources that I respect quite a bit as well that, uh, that, you know, getting Olympia to give the county and us local uh, another option is, you know, that's, you know, that is, um, especially as related to, um, is it MVAT or gas tax, right? So, so it's like, you know, that's directly related to use. I mean, that's not on there at all. And so um, I, I just think that, that you can't go to anybody with a question, well, here's a number and here's kind of an idea and here's a list of projects. What do you think? And it's gonna, it would take a lot of work to develop that package. And I think that's going to take time. And so we and, and so in the meantime, 84 <coughs> goes down to 82. It goes down to 80. It goes down to 77. You know because trips are coming out of the bank. I mean, the, right? Even if even if we don't have a bank, even if we don't have a bank, some new you know some growth is coming in, and and trips are um, uh, are you know the 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 remaining balance of trips that we have due to growth that we can actually charge new impact fees that number goes down and the portion left for the rest of us or so the portion actually paid for by growth goes down so the longer we take the uh, to do this the longer the less growth will actually pay for itself and yeah why because there's been so much inaction for so many years that's my feeling at least 
Any other comments? Questions? No, I, I absolutely see your point about the growth will continue to occur whether we have this, this system or not. Um, and I totally understand the point about needing it to pay for itself. It's the commitment and level of commitment that we are asked to impose upon our citizenry that comes with this package. And we don't know if we can afford the bill when we get up from the table. No, I'm playing out that analogy. But I'm just saying, we, we don't know other than the, the hope and prayer that the legislature is going to give us something. The hope and prayer we're going to qualify for $86 million in grants over the next 30 years. And the hope and prayer that our citizenry will tax itself even in one of these four ways. We're going to probably need more than one of these four ways. Bonds might get us to 96. We have to go over 50% capacity. But we're going to need to have that happen. It has to happen under this plan to build all the roads on the list, not even including the Sunset Ways and the Taos Drives and all the things that are not on that list. And this gets back to Nina's prioritization question, because once we commit to a course of action, and even if we knew how to pay the bill, we're going to be spending that money figuring out ways to maintain that LOSD, and that's where the money is going to go. And that Sunset Way is going to stay in purgatory, and the other streets are going to stay in purgatory because we can't fund those out of this. We can't fund those out of grants necessarily, maybe some of that money, but they're just going to sit there. And we're going to focus on keeping our LOS at a D citywide, except for six intersections. And that is going to become a de facto prioritization. And so I just need to know, will the public give us what we need to make that commitment? If they don't, we're in a deep, deep hole. And we've committed ourselves and opened the bank. And yes, whether we open the bank or not, the growth's coming. But it's that commitment through this mechanism, through this model, that we bind our citizenry to if we adopt this. And before we go down that road and make that commitment, some additional information about the public's appetite will be sure helpful to know. Understood. Okay. Thank you. Nice. Yeah, I, I appreciate appreciate what you're saying, Josh, and I um, I don't disagree with any of it, but I, I do wonder if it's feasible uh, to know the appetite for these. And the thing that concerns me is that you know, we're not the only ones. I mean, who? How long ago is it we, that we read the um, um, funding uh, package for Sound Transit? Uh, how long ago have we heard about how with the new um, class size the proposition, what is that going to mean to statewide funding and the taxation that we're going to be considering in that perspective. And so there could be tax fatigue that would uh, prevent many of these things from being popular. We don't know that. We're not going to know that in time to decide on this policy, which is, that's what's frustrating to me. So I and. Here's what I also think. I think that when we talked about public engagement, um, one important part we keep forgetting is who are you and who are you, who are you? We're trying to represent the public in a very complex matter. That is why I get up early in the morning and spend way too much time on this stuff because I know no one else can catch up with us. This is really tough stuff and I can't ask people to um, absorb the expertise to make this decision. We're going to have to do the best we can as members of the public who have invested in this. Uh, I still see uh, problems and, and uh, issues. I'm not as confident as, say, Paul is right now. And I think that maybe there are some things that we could, we've never moved it from where we started. We have a lot of questions answered. Randy and the team have been great at answering questions, but I haven't seen any of our concerns change the way we're going. Maybe now we're getting up to a point, well, oops, maybe we need to dial that a little differently. I would be really interested to see if there was an adjustment that could benefit the concerns that we have. <coughs> there's a leap of faith regard. <coughs> Whichever way you go, there's a leap of faith. If we had the, even if we had the luxury or the wherewithal to go to the public with some sort of an idea of what a package might look like, and if they indicated that, um, community indicated that it was willing to pay for that, it's a snapshot in time. That's, that, doesn't mean, that doesn't mean anything. It's One of the reasons we want you to come back every two to three years, not only the project costs change, but 
your ability to achieve this or not achieve this. You know, the bank may be open, but it's not open for 15 years. It's open for two to three. The worst that happens is you collect some fees that aren't enough because you don't match it, and then you just call the game off. You know, because you made a good faith effort to try and make the game work. I'm very concerned about trying to get the voter approval on this before you adopt the fees. It's across the schools tried that, and they had their head handed to them on multiple bond issues until they finally raised the fees. As Randy mentioned earlier, you also have level of service options. So if you were to go to the voters with a package and the voters were to say no to that package, you would then come back and have choices. Level of service, system, growth plans, variety of options. Okay, so good conversation all. Um, I think we can wrap it up I, because um, uh, the next step in this process I, I think we all, everybody's head needs to spend at least one night on a pillow to, to think about whether or not, you know, we're ready to take action on Monday. And we will convene and discuss this um, uh, definitely at leadership on Wednesday. If you have any comments, please send them along. Um, actually, um, Eileen is scheduled to be in leadership uh, on Wednesday. Um, uh, Stacy is not going to be there. And I know we can have three. So Josh, you missed yours. Maybe you should come Wednesday. Well, and, but yeah, then we canceled it. But then we canceled it because it was right before Thanksgiving. But so I'm just. You have a new opportunity. So that opportunity is out there. You can let me know if you want to do that. But I think also I think one device that worked in our favor when we did did Costco was that people had a chance to. We thought we had a whole package. We had a chance to think about it. We we came back. You know, here's some real. Here's some real questions and potentially substantive changes you know, I'd like to discuss. And I think if people become aware of those in the next couple days, and now is the time. Now is the time you know, to speak up and forward those because we've got to make a call whether or not we're going to even try to. Uh, well, I, 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 we've already advertised the public hearing. Is uh, that right? Actually, at this point, uh, I recall the public hearing is not required. So okay. we've not had to well, then How come you asked me about that? Yeah. Well, actually, I, we were, it was in the vote for a period of time. But okay. It included, it was not okay. required. Okay. Yes. All right. Well, until until we, the council, give, or you, or I guess the administration themselves, you know, makes a decision otherwise, uh, and the, or if we, the council, indicate to the administration we don't, uh, that we don't think it's ready for Monday, you know, that's still the plan until we tell them otherwise. Let, let me leave you with this, because I sure. heard a comment earlier, at least from my perspective, review of this. I think understanding concurrency is remarkably difficult. I didn't even know what the heck it meant until probably about 15 years ago. Um, I'd never even heard the term before in my educational or professional life. But I think a member of the public knowing whether to tax themselves is a lot easier to figure out than understanding this entire Proposal, and I don't think it requires understanding the nuances of this entire package we spend a better part of the year debating and discussing. Well, I, honestly, you know, I, I wasn't thinking that uh, under, helping people understand concurrency was was the question at all. It's not the question. The question is, is that is that to um, you know, build out the necessary infrastructure for Issaquah. Here's what it is, and here's how it's going to be paid for, and here's your portion, and here's here's how we propose to do it. Do you agree or not? To me, that's that's what the question is. But I think that's still a very complex thing to formulate. So, anyway. okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for the staff who 